Yo, welcome back to Traveler's Proc. Long time no so, see. So long time. <laughs> Me and Mike were looking the last time we did an episode. I think it was November 8th or something. Yeah, I actually can't believe that. I knew it's been a while because we we went through like, you know, tournament season and scrimming and then season of discovery also happened. <laughs> yeah. Uh we played a lot of WoW, so yeah, our our bad on that, but it, it's good to be back. It's good to we got a lot to talk episode. about. So much to talk about. Mike won a world. <laughs> There's a new map. There's a I don't, new the, game. New, ga new, <laughs> new game. New game. Season of Discovery came out. We, there's so much stuff that um, that's been going on. It's crazy. But congrats on winning. That must good. have been awesome for for everybody on the team, including yourself. You were probably so happy to win. It, honestly, it still doesn't. I mean, you know the feeling as well. Yeah. Like, I don't know if it really feels real and it also feels odd because like my brain just wants to play again like my brain just wants to compete mm -hmm. and it's, like, so it's like so weird first time in like 10 years i'm going into a new year of smite without having like a competitive like plan team all that yeah it's so weird for me as well um it's it, it's just a weird feeling because usually after worlds is over mm -hmm. there's so much going on in yeah. regards to next season, like you're trying to figure everything out, and it's it's definitely weird, but it's it's just gonna be different. And I th I think I think it's gonna be hard this year for everybody, but I think there's a lot of good years for like competing in Smite ahead of us. We just gotta make it through this year. And that's yeah. how I feel. Yeah, I think it's like the transition is bound to happen eventually. I'm just hoping that everyone keeps their cool before smite too and uh <laughs> yeah. has a good time i think people streaming have been pretty good for now like like i think bobby's tournament is really good we're both playing in that yep for people who don't know about that i believe february 10th is when we're playing yep saturday february 10th so you'll see a lot of people streaming on twitch for that i think some people are going to scrim as well and they'll probably stream yeah. that my team i have a eu guys so it might be hard we will probably only scream a couple times yeah i gotta figure out if we are or not I, I think scrimming would be cool if people want to yeah yeah i think on, we're gonna do like scrims i think on saturday because that's like the only day because because everybody works on my team and oh, then davy's yeah. davy can't do late either so it's like but i think we i think saturday will work so we'll probably scrim then so that'll be fun like that'll be a fun thing to watch on the weekend i feel like if people tune in because i'll definitely stream it It'll for sure cool. yeah so that'll be cool um and then yeah i mean who knows people will do whatever content wise and i think it'll be i think it, even though it'll be a weird year i still think it'll be a good year of smite honestly i guess we could touch on this really quick like we've both played a good bit of season 11 how have you felt about it i like it a lot actually i've been i played 11 hours of ranked yesterday nice. and support is like is broken right now it's really good it feels mm -hmm. both dueling like dueling in general just feels so good i love how where they move proc camp yes that's a huge thing it's so nice i love the items they added in for support it makes them so strong they buff mystical mail too which is you love mystical fun mail. yeah i love mystical yeah. mail for anyone who hasn't been watching aurora He's literally, like, your title's literally just been season 11 mystical mail, right? Yeah. I love it. <laughs> He's just running around with, like, I watched you play back-to-back -back RDO games yesterday, and I was like, this is the most Aurora thing I've ever seen. <laughs> just double RDO games, mystical mail, like, basically rush. Like, I love it. Yeah. No, it's been fun. I love the the shop. Okay, there's a lot of RNG on this map, I feel like. Oh, it, it's like... It, it is RNG. The RNG part of it, I feel like people will get confused, is that... It's where the chests spawn. It's every other chest that you get a shop. It's speed pad shop, speed pad shop. But it's like the location. But the, the shop is broken. It's so OP. There was a fight yesterday. It was mid team fight. I literally had like twenty or or twenty two thousand gold, and I had enough to buy mystical. I bought it in the middle of the team fight and a five hundred pot and mm -hmm. killed everybody. It was so funny. Dude, I was playing ranked with uh, with Leah, my girlfriend, yesterday. Uh huh. And we're just like in the like qualifier lobbies, you know? So it's like like 1500 MMR. And I'm playing Tiamat and I'm literally just doing nothing for the first 10 minutes. I'm just farming. I'm like level 12, everyone else is level 10. And there's a fight where I guess like duo side back harpies are now, like where old green buff is, like right there in that corridor yeah. down in the mid. And there's a Chester there. And there's like a 3v3 team fight that's happening. And I killed the Chester with my Tiamat one when I was hitting someone else. 
and it spawned a shop and I literally bought tablet. Like I bought a full <laughs> item with all the farm I had. And at the end of the fight, I killed everybody and I had like 12 tablet stacks and I didn't even back to base with it. It was so broken. It Dude, was the funniest thing. It was the most fun part about the map is the shop, but it's broken though. And like the, the shop, like the Chester spawns and then the meteors like RNG as well. So yeah. like, I feel like Smite really doesn't have a lot of RNG. Like there's crit obviously, but that's in like almost every game. And then there's the Primal and Oni Fury. There's not really much uh, like RNG in the game other yeah. than that the last couple of years. Is there anything else you can think of that there was? I was trying to think playing yesterday if there's like any other RNG things. Like the Meteor is like super RNG. Um, oh no, you know what was RNG was the first iteration of the beacon. Or not the beacon, the, the tower. What was it called? The tower. With, were you st not the tower? <laughs> the tower. The thing that spawned the trebuchet. What was that called? Oh, oh, the, the obelisk. Or the whatever. obelisk. Yeah, the first obelisk. Remember, it marked random jungle camps oh, that on was, the map. It, it was a pattern. Oh, was it a pattern? Okay, it so that. Pattern, so, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. No, you're right. That was a pattern. So that wasn't even RNG. So there wasn't really. There hasn't been that much RNG things in Smite, yeah. so it's like... I'm not going to lie. I didn't even know that it was every other, that it was like speed shop, speed shop. I didn't even know that. Yeah. I thought it was actually random. Yeah, yeah, no, I think it's speed shop every every other chest. It should be mirrored, right? Like Yeah, so like on the other side of the maps, shop, yeah. so like if, if if the other team kills a chest on the other side, you won't know like if they kill a chest late or whatever, so... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think my first impression was Season 11 when I first... I didn't really pay attention to the patch notes or anything at Worlds. Yeah, same. But I remember people mentioning the idea of this, like, teleporter connecting duo and solo. My instant reaction was, I don't like that. <laughs> like, uh-oh. Uh, but they actually implemented it really well. I I, I love it, actually. Yeah, it's it, fun. I thought I was going to be scared of it and I was going to hate it, but I actually like it a lot. Like, the fact that it doesn't – it's, like, eight minutes, I think, it can actually start being used y or something yep. like that. Mm-hmm. And then also the amount of time it takes to teleport and the fact that it shows people, I feel like it opens up a lot of really cool map play. Like, honestly, solo lane to me has seemed really strong too because just your ability, whether you have TP or not, you can just beat every single fight. It's kind of cool. There was a, I think it was against Karmic yesterday. He was playing Achilles. He was in my lane, it felt like, for like the rest mm -hmm. of the game after yeah. the teleporter spawn. It was so troll. But, um,. All right, we got two huge things that we can we can talk about. There's worlds, and then there's my two. I feel like we should talk about worlds Let's do first. Worlds first, yeah. Yeah. So, oh man, where do, what, where do you want to start? Well, I don't know. How do you want to start? I guess how did you how do how was your team feeling going in since you guys won? Uh, like, were you guys feeling really good or were literally you, the worst I've ever felt? Yeah. In the scrims, yeah, I. I feel like I never am a person where I just don't believe that mm -hmm. I can win or whatever. But I actually had a couple days where it was so bad where I'm just like, I just give up. Like, I just have, like, lost, like, faith a little bit. Like, we had days where everyone was just tired, not really talking that much. People just didn't seem motivated. They didn't seem energetic. It was really hard to fix it as well. Yeah. Because we would talk about it, and I said, like, I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it happened eventually. Uh, we knew that... Like, we didn't know if it was people's sleep schedules were a little off or if people just weren't playing outside of, like, scrims enough or what it was. It just didn't really feel right. And we had a couple – we had a couple pretty big arguments or discussions, I guess, leading up to Worlds. Mm -hmm. And our last – there was, like, a week period right before Worlds where we had a few really good scrim days in a row, regardless of – I don't know if we won or lost the scrims, but they felt productive. We felt like we were learning a lot and we yeah. knew what we wanted to do. And then I would say the last two or three days were miserable because we were in this weird limbo of we know what we want to do and we know what we want to play. And when we're playing other things that we don't really think that we're going to actually play at Worlds, it kind of felt like a waste of time. But then when we would play, you know, our 30th, the Morgan mid game of the week, people, it, it was just hard to replicate like game day energy for us, I think. Mm -hmm. I've had teams where sometimes they're really good about that and sometimes they're not so great. We weren't so great about it before Worlds. You can never replicate it, though. It's, like, yeah. it's completely... Like, I always tell people, like, scrims and, like, playing in actual matches. It's just two different types of games. Like... Yeah. It's so different because I feel like 
when you scrim, you you're literally scrimming every day, sometimes two blocks mm. a day. So people are not going to be 100% focused, locked in, like regardless if you say you are or not, like you're just not going to be like everybody, including myself, yeah. is not going to be playing their best. Like for, for an example, like I remember we scrimmed, um, I was playing a little bit of Kepri and we scrimmed the Leviathans and I stacked like prophetic cloak like so easily. And I was like, oh, Kepri feels so good. Like if I get my cloak stacked and like the, like, uh, like the week before or like the two day period before like the Monday, Tuesday scrims, I remember we played Leviathans once. I got like six stacks in like 15 minutes yep. or something because like everybody was just trying to not let me stack. And that's like something that happens in the game. Like everybody's more focused, like it, but it's even revved up even more like in the actual game. So. Sure. Yeah. It's like it's completely it's just two different games. I feel like it's so different. Yeah, it is I, I think that was one of the major Discussions that we had is that like last is really good about Trying to wake up and bring a lot of energy, but it got to a point where I think other people felt like it was forced and they're just like yeah Like I just can't I can't like give you game day energy He's like yeah, but if you come into scrims and you're thinking like I'm gonna try my hardest in the scrim and it's like, yeah, like he is right, and it is good to have energy, and it is good to come into yeah. scrims with, you know, a goal or like I'm, we're gonna work on this today, or we're gonna work on like this comp or whatever it is. Uh, but yeah, I think it was scary for everybody to just have, I guess I would call it blind faith of when we're on stage, like this is what we're gonna do, and here's how we want to play, and this is why it'll feel different. But because we we actually had the discussion, we were like we should have just not qualified through. Like, we should have made it so that we had to play in the qualifier tournament because it would give us game day reps and it would give us, like, mm -hmm. being able to actually get in that zone. Like, I actually thought it was really good for the Kings, for example. They ended up losing to... The Warriors. Was it the Warrior, the Wardens, or who was it? Oh, yeah, they lost to... The SEC no, team. I they think lost they the team we played, the, the Scarabs. Oh, the Scarabs, that's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, like, losing to a team right off the bat and then still qualifying, I feel like is nice because... You get some of those jitters out where you haven't played in, you know, two months or whatever it's been yep. in a real game. And you're also able to have some adversity where, you know, maybe there's disagreements about how you're playing or you feel like there's mistakes being made that shouldn't be happening. And just getting those out of the way. That's how I felt in the quarterfinals, honestly. It was like, mm -hmm. it was so sloppy. I think both of our teams had some sloppy moments in the quarterfinals. Yeah, no, our first game was really... I knew going to that set that that game was... Like, that set was going to be hard. Like, everybody's like... Yeah. I hate when people... I hate when people say, oh, it's an SEC team. It's a free yeah. win. It's not. Like, it, it, look at the Mambo set. Mambo could have easily beat they should have Leviathans. Them, in my opinion. They yeah. could have easily won the set. Like, if you actually go back and watch the set... Oh, yeah. They could have easily won that set like i'm not saying that they're better than the leviathans because usually like nine times out of ten leviathans probably beat them in a set but yeah. like that set best of three you can lose that pretty yeah, easily that day that set anything yeah happen, yeah like it's not like those i just knocked the mic my bad but <laughs> the the those sets are not free wins like at all like they're they're gonna be the hardest matches of the entire tournament like look at the kings last year against yeah. um the ravens yeah ravens um like they swept worlds or whatever right but the the people people always say oh the ravens look so good like that that was like their closest set but that's just because it was their first set they played in a while and it's just like you got to get the motor going again when you play yeah. i feel like so the pace of the game is totally different. I feel like when you go from scrims, especially like both of our teams, probably we both probably played the Levi's and the Warriors probably more than ever, like probably 90% of our 90%. Scrims, right? yeah. yeah. We played the Kings and the Ravens a couple times yeah, as same. well. Yeah. yeah. I think we played the Ravens twice and the Kings maybe three or four times, like mm -hmm. blocks total across two months because we thought we would play one of them in the first round. Yeah. So we're almost entirely playing two different teams and you get like these two different like scrim metas almost within mm -hmm. those two sets that you're playing against those teams. And when you play against something different, like the pace of the game, one is more serious. Like you said, people won't just give you like cloak stacks, for example. And that ganks or like as well. Yeah, people exactly. just won't die to random ganks as much. Like yeah, that's it's something very I was, rare. Yeah. Something I was talking about with your team and something that's always been hard. All of your laners, like Spin, Paul, and Baskin, are, in my opinion, the most disciplined, like 
trio of laners to play against in a real game like they don't get ganked randomly like Sano does a really good job of tracking the jungler i feel like that's why i feel like yeah in Sino, <laughs> Sino doesn't like when anyone gets ganked as uh, well yeah. Every <laughs> screen, that was screamed scream, no matter what version of scream i played with he loved being like yeah we're just dying to every freaking gang like, <laughs> yeah he's like and we're like dude we're under our tower he's like yeah just back up i don't care you know <laughs> he, he just loves it but yeah every oh my god i don't know if it's sino that makes sense but i just think they're also all like they're no they're all players. great as yeah. well but i feel like the combination of them being so disciplined with sino tracking the jungler that's why i feel like it's so yeah. hard to gank everybody on our team that's why like i hate yeah. scrims when i hate scrims with shinto is the biggest offender in mm -hmm. my experience like there's days where Shinto is like a little tired and he's just like kind of running it down. Like he'll dash in off cooldown and stuff. And then we had a couple scrims right before Worlds where it was like game day Shinto where he's like super disciplined and like he's just five levels ahead of me and he's just like one shotting me. <laughs> I'm just like, okay, like this is really good practice because like he's playing the way that he plays in a real game and it's like noticeably harder and the pace of the game is no noticeably different because yeah. they're not just taking random fights. Like they're waiting for him to be strong. And then they're forcing fights off of him being strong. So it's just, it just changes the game entirely. So actually, like the quarterfinals, I always think best of three single limb quarters are always the scariest part of any tournament to me. Whether it's just hard. Like, yeah. yeah the wh whether you're a favorite team or not, literally, especially when you're going into it and you don't have a huge sample size of what the other team wants to play. Like, yeah. if you lose game one, making the adjustment of game one going into game two is really scary. Also, I guess, well, I'll talk about I'll talk about what I was going to talk about after, but I want to say uh, for us going in, I felt like we we were getting crushed every game. I think and we screens. won. Yeah, we like no joke. We won. I'll talk about so. I want to bring it up later when we get to the later rounds when we talk about it. But mm -hmm. um, I think we won maybe like a total of like three scrims against the Warriors, like in the like the three one month the three week period. Mm -hmm. Um, it was funny because when we came back, we were doing really well, like right after playoffs, like when we first started screaming again, which is very weird for our team because usually when we take a break, we are garbage beyond belief. Yeah, that's how we are. Yeah. Um, but we're doing very well. And then, I don't know, like the week after that, we just lost. It was so funny. We, we literally won the, we played Leviathans. I think we beat Leviathans maybe like six times, like in a month. And like we, I mean, we were probably like, we probably had under 10 wins in scrims and like almost triple digit losses, like for sure. <laughs> like it was bad. Like, <laughs> I don't know how many games we played, but we definitely, I'd say we I feel won. Like you guys doubled a good bit from what it seemed like. About 10 to 20% of our scrims, like between there and lost 80% easily. M maybe even more, maybe more like 10% we won. But it was like, it was not good. But I was feeling good still going to the event because I knew we would play, mm -hmm. just we would play better. Because I know that when it comes to these tournaments, it's like the scrims never have really mattered at all because yeah. I've been on both sides. I've been on the side where I've lost every game. Like I'm yep. against you guys in season, what was it five. season five? We played you guys like exclusively and you guys that's how crushed we, us yeah that way the year before yeah. lg we lost every single game yeah so like i've been on both sides of it so i was like it is what it is like if scrims are not going great in this and i've had i had some days too where i felt really bad i remember there was a one day i got i was so mad in one of the scrims i was like i was not talking inside i was like you need to talk you need to talk or we should not play this is such a waste of time it was so bad i was so tilted one of the days but no there was so many days that just felt impossible to win but i've it so we were still getting things even out of those days it just felt really 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 bad which is the thing Dude, it's, it's funny you say that because when we first came back we were playing awfully and i had days like that where i literally didn't talk and i was just so tilted and i had to talk to cherry about it he was like why are you so upset and i was like i didn't realize it at the time but we took two weeks off from the tournament until we scrimmed again mm -hmm. and right after the tournament like maybe the tuesday after or something cherry and i literally went into like our prep doc and we took notes on all of our tournament games and like had timestamps of like here's what we think we did well that we want to keep doing here's what we think we need to improve on before worlds and like here's examples of like oh i don't like how we played 
this fire giant or like oh we like we know we can't do you know x fight and you know whatever and we just like didn't go over it when it felt fresh and i think i was really annoyed at that because we'd come back to scrims and we just had a couple days where it's like rough you're just like shaking off rust you know and whatever but then when we're like actually not mechanically missing everything and we're still losing it annoyed me because i'm like oh we're doing these same things that we know are bad but we didn't really ever go over the tournament so people don't have the the prioritization of like oh you know what like i'm gonna work on rotating to this beacon fight or i'm gonna work on you know whatever it is that we wanted to work on and i felt like it was like a wasted opportunity of like we just played literally we played four best of fives back to back to back to back days like <laughs> We, we played so many games, and they're all, like, pretty high-intensity, like, important sets. Yeah. There's a lot to learn from those games, and I felt like we just didn't, really. And that tilted me so hard, like, beyond belief, that we just, like, didn't really watch them back and get much out of it. And then we had, like, the only two good days of scrims we had. I think we double-blocked, and the first day, our second block was the Warriors. We stomped them two games, and they, like, rage quit the scrims. That's the classic for them. Yeah, yeah. It, we almost never have that happen mm -hmm. against them where we just stomp them. And then the next day, they're our morning block, and we stomp them, like, two or three games again, and then they, like, rage quit the scrims. And I was like, okay, we're back. Nice. We're good. <laughs> no, we're, we were not back, by the way. We were definitely not back. They were just having a couple of rough days, I think. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it, it's so weird because – Everyone always says, like, oh, losing scrims is good. And people will say the whole losing is learning thing. I actually think it is genuinely good to struggle before a tournament. It is good. Because you talk about all the things that people think are important that you're messing up. And you, like, really think about it. I mean, it's like how I look at it is, like, you literally are tossed into the middle of the ocean. You're treading for life. And, like, mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a guy... There or you're you're with your whole team. Everybody's treading, and you see like a boat in the distance or something, and like you're like, let's work together and get there, or we'll just die. Just yeah. sitting here, not saying like you have to actually fight, uh, or not fight. Like arguments are good, like because it actually makes you confront your team about the things that you want to do differently, and it For actually sure. helps, um, like make your team better. And you, you've probably had this the the only time where I've truly been like miserable on a team mm -hmm. is when you're in that spot and people don't want to bring like they yes. don't want to be con confrontational and yeah. they don't want to have the argument yeah because then it's just like then it's you know kind of then it just you know, it feels like it's over it's just doomed yeah exactly or it's maybe like you'd get the feeling of maybe what sino said to you of like it's always like what are we even doing like if we're not going to like if you're frustrated and you're not even talking about what you're frustrated about then there's no point being here because you're not going to improve yeah no i i hate like i I've been lucky. I've been on so many good teams. I've only happened for like one team that I've played on that's mm -hmm. been like that. But every other team, like just being able to have those conversations and just being able to work things out, it's just trying. It's good in a regard to getting everybody on the same page. I feel like as well because mm -hmm. if you're just winning all the time and you're not really struggling at all, and you get something thrown at you that is different and you don't like if you're not on the same page as everybody else then it's a lot harder to like react and change i feel like to it I, I think it also kind of i don't know who on your team this would really apply to but for us stardes wouldn't be the most vocal like every single day yeah but when you do have arguments like that like when that guy speaks up and he's normally not that vocal but then he'll say like, oh, I actually think this is a big problem. Like, people tend to, like, focus in a little bit more and really listen to what they're saying. Because, like, for me, I just love arguing. Like, I'll argue with Lass, like, back and forth about games. Or, like, oh, we should have done, like, this or that or whatever. Yeah. But no, I'm the same way. Yeah, when, when someone else actually yeah. steps in and people listen to them, I think that you get a lot of really productive moments out of that as well. Yeah, me and me and Sino, me and I mean almost everybody on our team I would argue with. Me and me and Paul, me and Sino, me and Baskin, me and Cyclone. <laughs> like everybody I can think of. <laughs> but yeah. And you know who loves to argue as well is is uh, Baskin. He loves it. Baskin is Yeah. But I love it too, so it's yeah. it's a bad mix sometimes. I used to play a joke on Baskin. <laughs> this, this was so long ago when I first met him. Like, 
<laughs> it was like some random topic and we like argued about it and then the next day I purposely took the other side of the argument <laughs> made him into it and then he argued me that way as well like he just argues argue he loves Sino it. loves it too but I feel like Baskin actually acknowledges that he likes to argue oh for sure Sino doesn't but I feel like he likes it too oh Sino loves yeah. it for sure you can't be like Sinos with sports Twitter and not love the <laughs> Yeah. Anyways, I think it's interesting. So both of our teams kind of weren't feeling, not that we were feeling bad, but like scrims were not great scrims at were least. Terrible for us yeah. in terms of results, but I felt like we got a lot out of them. Which I don't. Was good. I don't know if there's much more to talk about on it. I believe Paul was the one who was asked when we did the like draft selection thing for you guys picking the scarabs. Mm hmm. I was also of the opinion that I thought those SEC teams were pretty good, actually. Like, I yeah. think, was it the the Wardens, like the LUN team, that was the team that was like, Yeah, it was close really it. close, yeah. They, even, they had a lot of really good games. Yep. Like, they had a lot of really good games They could have easily well. made it, for yeah. sure. I think, what, was there anything else that went into that? Like, did you feel more confident that, like, my guess was that you guys felt like that team played slow, and I feel like you guys are probably pretty confident in your like late game against anyone. I mean, for sh I feel like for sure they that was a small factor, but the biggest factor I think that we talked about is like, um, at the end of the day, they are an SEC team still, and like they're not going to be scrimming as much. Mm -hmm. And if we can't beat an SEC team to make the semifinals, we don't deserve to win anyways. Is basically like mm -hmm. how we looked at it, because I feel like. They are all really good players. Like Deathwalker is insanely good player. Like April's new to playing. He played, he, so he played, well. he played yeah. very good. I mean, everybody on their team played good. I feel like, mm -hmm. but at, at the end of the day, like they they're not able to put in as much time as like the SPL teams in terms of prep, preparation and stuff, especially when they're here because um, they're not going to be able to scrim as much or play ranked as much just because they don't have access to computers and stuff. Yeah, because they don't actually live here, so. We just thought going into it, we, we'd have the best chance against them. And doing research on them was pretty easy as well because they made a roster change um, pretty late into the oh, really? into, into the SEC uh, season. So, like, their sample the size made? of gods. I think Emilito was on the team. They got – Emilito was a supporter, and they got, oh, they got right. silence. And I think – I can't remember who else. There was one other. But basically, like, looking at their games, we, we kind of knew exactly, like – like Silence's God Pool was literally um, Ganesh, Sobek, Fafnir, um, and then Athena, I think. I don't even know. Okay, let's talk about Athena. I think Athena was the most garbage, gaslit, just banned every game pick. And like the, the God was terrible and people were banning it. I remember I talked to Deathwalker at the after party and he's like, he told me I, he he personally was fighting for them not to ban it against us. And I told him if they did that, we would have picked it and it would have probably been really good for you guys actually if you did that. Because um, the thing with Athena is she's she's just bad in lane, I feel like. And like lane is was so important at this yeah. tournament for duo lane. I mean, when we get to our set, we could talk about how the lane went, but like Athena was so bad in lane, like people were putting it in jungle because they're like, oh, this god's OP, we have to play it somewhere, and like that is like the worst way to look at it. I feel like we for had, a god that was so good, we had so many arguments about Athena on our team. So yeah, when she first got buffed, it was before the kickoff, the second kickoff tournament, before mm -hmm. the second phase. And we played it mid and jungle in that tournament. We did not play it support. And yeah. we specifically played it in like I remember that bruiser like damage rolls to play like rotation prio and like try to speed up the game a little bit. And something I've like I feel like a little like biased when I say this, but when I first came into the league in the fall of season two, which was like my first full split yeah. I played, I played we played like twenty eight games. I played literally twenty one Athena games or something. Like she was by far my most played character, and I played her, like, throughout my career here and there. Like, I played her at, like, season four Worlds when no one else played her. Like, there was a bunch of, like, small things uh, where I'd, like, always go back to the pick. Like, I played her last year a couple times randomly when no one else was really playing her. And the thing I've always said about Athena is that you don't win frontline matchups as that character. Like, support versus support, you're yeah. normally worse in lane and actually starting a fight like if you try to Athena taunt like a Kepri or something, like mm -hmm. it's actually like pretty sketch. Like it doesn't go that yeah. well for you. Like, I yeah, Deathwalker started to no, 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 chime no. in, but Deathwalker literally said like, 
I'm literally Osiris with full stack passive. If Athena taunts me, I could care less. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And you have when you know, I items about. like Spirit Robe and also Guardians. I tried to argue this with my teammates so much. Guardians literally have CCR in their kit. They they it used the to class be, passive. Yep. Yeah. It used to be that you would need to build like two CCR items and then taunts not that scary to you. If you just build Spirit Robe, literally just Spirit Robe. You shouldn't be afraid of dying as Even a guardian. Relic dagger. Yeah, relic dagger works yeah. too, like anything. And you're just not gonna die to taunt like that, especially in the duration of the taunt. And it's so easy, like imagine an Athena dash taunting like a Sobek, for example. Like you don't want to be in that spot. He just plucks you before your taunt even goes off, and you're dead. Like you're in nowhere. Or you like, could get Ganesh Silence as well. Yeah, Ganesh yeah. Silence. Like there's so many bad matchups for her. And like you said, she also loses lane to almost all these characters. So I felt like I tried to get her, it actually tilted me so much, I tried to get her to be in scrims, and teams would literally just not do it. I remember one of the few blocks we did not play against the Levi's and the Warriors, I think we played the Hounds, actually, and we were second pick, and I didn't ban Athena, and they didn't first pick it, so I was like, oh, okay, maybe other teams have done this, or like they want to play against it or something. I top two to Athena, they insta dodge the lobby and then banned it from first pick side and they're just like nah it's never gonna be in the game <laughs> i hate it so much dude i hate it so much like what do you mean it's yeah. never gonna be in the game like if you want to win okay if you want to win a tournament my opinion has always been whatever you think is the most broken character in the game you, you are trolling yourself it. not playing against it because there's yeah. gonna like you're gonna play against a player like we have the discussion against you guys for example like we didn't actually think anyone was going to play set mid, but we knew it was a possibility. Yep. But we didn't actually think people were going to play it because we figured, like, oh, most teams are just going to think, like, mages are really good and they're going to prefer to play, like, this style or whatever. But, like, what if you need to ban set mid and you need to give Paul, you know, like, Thoth or this other, like, meta character that other people are playing? Like, you just never know. Like, you should be ready to have that option mm -hmm. to, like, get off of that ban. And people just it, – it tilts me so much. Yeah, no, she she was so bad. Like, I don't know. She was the most overrated character. Like, she was good, though. I will say she was good in the mage meta because... I think so, too, yeah. Because um, that lane was so volatile in the early Having game. Having a in a yeah. non-TP lane is such a big deal, for sure. Yeah, that, and also, like, if one of the mages can get ahead, they're so, they were so oppressive. Like, yep. um, okay, so... I'm sidetracking the conversation a little, little bit. Back to that meta. I was talking to Twig at the airport about this as well um, when we were going. I want to say on record that I feel like Raijin, that version of Raijin was the best god in Smite ever. Hands down. Like uh, there's no, lane yeah, Raijin, the solo yeah. lane version of Raijin with that build, there's never been a better god in Smite than that character ever. Like, not even close, I feel like. He was so broken. I remember I would literally, I would Q ranked and literally picked Raijin and I would get 15 kills. Like every, I was playing in support and I was getting like 10, I was just going to build on support. It literally felt it like was you were playing so, the CDR match of the day. It was so <laughs> broken, so bro. Crazy. It was like, dude, like, especially in this era of Smite, like people always say like, I played in all the, like Guan Yu was broken when he first came out, sure. Baron was broken when he first came out, sure. But like, I feel like today people are just better at the game people are just better at games in general like if a god could be as good as raijin was in today's game like imagine placing that version of raijin back five years back oh ten god. years dude that kid he was so broken that was the most he was so much fun though but he was the most broken character ever it was crazy yeah it, it really was the perfect storm of all of the items i except for like maybe pythags got buffed and the lifesteal tiki got buffed. Yeah. And their defense item got but Like, so many things. Yeah. And it was like... And he got... He didn't get, like, a re-kit, but he got a really, like, He got a really buff. strong yeah. buff, yeah, with his passive and more damage. I don't know. It, like, initial damage on yeah. his two. Like, everything, yeah. It was crazy. He was crazy. That character was toxic. Very yeah. Very toxic. I, I, I remember, like, that... It's such a weird... That, like, mage meta almost feel, feels like... A fever dream to me a little bit because I, we played it against you guys at the kickoff tournament. We literally played Raijin and solo. You owned us. And, yeah. and I kept saying to Nika for like a month, I was like, hey, surely you can do this against other warriors. Like, surely it's not just Yorm that you can like do this against. Yeah. And he was like, yeah, maybe. But like, we were just practicing other things as a team. So we like, it didn't really fit in. And then 
when everybody started picking out, it was like, uh -oh. I mean, it was Fine OK who was playing it a lot. Yeah, he started spamming it. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, Baskin hated me for this, but like, like, usually. I don't really want people to play gods like ever, like for the intent, like for all the years I've played. There's been a couple like, like exceptions your to play what that guy is playing, sort of thing. No, not not that. Just that I think Ryzen's broken and you should play him. Oh, yeah, like yeah, yeah. like that type of thing. Like I don't ever want to force one of my if they don't want to play something that's they don't have to play it. But I was like every day, Baskin's like, can you shut up about Ryzen, dude? I literally brought it up like multiple times a day. I'd be like, <laughs> we literally live this the funniest thing. Ever. There was me and Paul died at a pyro, and there was like I don't know who we were playing it. So it might have been you guys. I, I don't even remember. It was someone, but they were right. It was in a scrim, and like <laughs> Ryzen was just there. He did no damage to us, and I was like, oh my god, Ryzen just killed us again. <laughs> And Paul's like, dude, we have to ban Ryzen. <laughs> and Paul tried to do it Baskin. Reels, Marcus had a clip of it after the game. And Baskin's like, he didn't do any damage to you guys. Like, what are you saying? I'm like, dude, Ryzen's OP. And he got so mad. It was so, it was the funniest awesome. thing. And then he's like, <laughs> I forgot what the I'd say best can guess what he'd be like and then he'd start responding to me Ryzen and I'd be like okay dude because every time he said something to me I'd be like I would just say Ryzen and he gets so mad so he started doing it to me and it was so troll and it was so funny because like he still thought it was bad for the longest time and then he started playing it a lot he's like okay maybe this god's OP <laughs> <laughs> after after like it took like a couple weeks and he's like okay this god's broken yeah, that, that oh really my god the best. like when <laughs> when you dig down and you're like he like he has to you gotta understand like from his perspective if you keep saying it like he's dug deep like he has to hold his stance that the character is not that good or else mm -hmm. like he has to tell you you were right no one wants to do that <laughs> oh yeah. man but yeah i just thought that was funny but I don't even know why I thought of Ryzen we, from we were when we talking about, about Athena in the Mage meta. And I was going to yeah, say, I do yeah. think Athena in the Mage meta. She was good then. Yeah, it, it made a lot more sense to me because the amount of damage you had behind the taunt was just higher for one. And also the amount of targets that were good to taunt was just higher. Like You can walk up easier as well because they had right. another mage. Like there's another frontliner. It's harder to walk past them. Like even though like yeah, Osiris or Bologna might not do a lot of damage to you, but they're going like Xe or Kin some of them. If they're just hitting you as you walk up, like you take like 20% well, and that matters a lot. Even like past that, to me one of the things that has always been really good against Athena is when you know in Athena like the most classic matchup ever was like playing Athena versus Geb and they were like a couple different ways you could play it like you could be behind your soul in your asgab and bait them to taunt your soul in her and then you just shield them and then it's like okay what's the athena do you just go on her team the other thing you can do is if an athena goes into dash taunt a front line like let's say it's a morgan lefay solo if the morgan lefay has to alt immune your taunt and then it's just firing like some damage at your back line, that's a like, win yeah like you're, yeah. you're happy as the athena and your back line's not really under threat if I go to taunt an Osiris, he's gonna go, <laughs> and he alts into my back line and tethers yep. them. The fight's screwed. Like, yeah, you can't kill that guy on the engage. Yep. I have no peel anymore, and my carries have to run. So then, what ends up happening is you're the Athena in the middle of their team, and while your team's running away from the Osiris, they just kill you. Yeah, I mean that's the best way to look at it because usually, like how, how team fights play out is someone you're either playing to engage on the other team or you're playing for them to engage on you, yep. and like. When you have a double mage backline, or like you're you're you have a, your soul leader's a mage, and you know, you only have one tank. Like your one tank's gonna be up, sure, but it's a tank that doesn't do any damage for the most right. part because it's a support. Well, that's the <clears> other <throat> thing about it as well. Is yeah, when you do taunt that one tank, you don't even have to full commit on them. Like you just that, poke them. Yeah, if that tank gets yeah. low enough to the point where like now they can't tank fire or something like there there are a number of plays they can do is just like halved like they just don't have someone to do, like tank objectives or you like zone anyone like any of that yeah and that's why it was so strong because you could just dash like in mid like when it felt really op and my people hated playing against it especially my team is like like in mid tower like tier one or like tier two the athena's literally just dash taunting on cooldown yep and like not full committing like my favorite thing to do is athena 
um, when I played it as well, I would just dash in and then I just wouldn't taunt. Yeah. And I would alt out if they committed on me or I would I would taunt someone else. Like I would dash in, wait a little bit, not taunt. And then I would taunt somebody else and it would always work out really well. Like, because mm -hmm. I knew, like, that's how they're like, oh, the Athena's going to dash in well, and taunt. Conditioned to yeah. Play around the taunt. Yeah. yeah. So that's how, that's how I would play every fight when I played it. And the, the other thing with Athena too, I feel like a lot of people forget is that she got um, nerfed a little bit as well. Her alt. DR got reduced, I think, by it was a 10 or 15%. It went from like 35 to 25 or something yeah. like that. Yeah. And I, I feel like that matters a little bit. It's not like going to make her break her, I feel like, but it definitely made it so you can kill her a little easier. Because the, the other thing about her, when with that buff, with the the ultimate uh, damage reduction when you're channeling it, like it worked. So it always works on the player you're ulting, but it worked on yourself as well. This most recent buff they did, yeah. did to her. Um, and I feel like that mattered for sure. Like, it was so hard to kill an Athena if she dashed in and just ulted out. Like, yeah. I lived with, like, one HP, like, multiple times. So, like, the 10% mm -hmm. would have mattered. But I don't know. The, her getting nerfed a little bit and then it not being... If it was Mage Meta still, she'd be good 100%. Yeah. So let's fast forward that to... Uh, were there any other quarterfinals you wanted to talk about? I mean, I, I don't think we have to touch any other... Unless you want to talk about your set a little bit. Like, th those games were crazy, I feel yeah, like. Yeah, I honestly, it's normally I'm pretty good about remembering our games. I just kind of, <laughs> I just remember that they were really sloppy, and I remember there were a lot of, like, sieges that we just did not play well. I inted a couple of them, and there were just some, like, like for example, like, we had Dardas on Mori, and one of the things, any game, any season, any meta that Dardas plays Mori, you will not catch that guy inside the fire pit he is always looking to be on the outside of the fire pit, and we stun a frontliner, and we kill the frontliner. That's how he's always played Mori. Mm -hmm. And then we lost, like, a team fight or two at Fire Giant because Rupert back here is in the middle of the fire pit, and I'm literally watching him try to stealth, and he's walking over the fire line and just reveals himself, gets one shot. And I'm like, nice, okay. <laughs> awesome. So we're just, we forgot how to play the game, I guess. Uh, yeah. And we just had stuff like that, and it was really sloppy. Zap Dan's altered into five people, like... I don't know what happened in that set. It was a sloppy. That's just how those best of threes are. I feel like it's just yeah. so fifty-fifty. But you just it, like once you get once you get it going, you get it going for sure, though. Yeah, but honestly, the only it sounds dumb because it didn't win us the game or define the set. Mm -hmm. But the most important part of that set to me was when we two v two killed Hurry and Zap on like wave one in duo. We killed them, like, we played them four games last tournament. We 3 won them. We killed them in lane all four games. And all I was thinking going into the tournament was I just believed, in my opinion, like, I normally don't think of players this way. I don't find it helpful to. But, like, mm -hmm. with a younger player, I think giving them confidence is really important. And I just felt like Coast was the best ADC in the world. Is this how I felt? I, I felt, mean, he was I, in that I, tournament, for sure. Yeah, and I, and It I was just, even close, I feel like. Yeah, I just believe in him. A lot. I just believe that he was a good a good mm -hmm. player. And once we got that kill, and he felt the it's like it because it's different. Like I try to tell, like Dar doesn't cherry going into the tournament. Like it is different being on the Ravens last year against the number one seed Kings with the expectation that everyone thinks you're going to lose and there's no pressure on you. It is a very different world to be on a team that hasn't played in two months. And people expect you to at least play well or win. And you feel like you have to be one of the players who is performing well for your team to win. Like, there's a lot of internal pressure there that he probably has on himself. And then the second he can just get a good start and feel people, like, cheer for him and he can, like, relax a little bit. That was, like, the biggest moment of the tournament for me, like, in terms of, like, getting stuff off to a good, like, rhythm, you know? Yeah, no, for sure. But yeah, that set was crazy. Like the, the, those games were so. I remember I didn't get to watch like fully, but mm -hmm. I got to watch parts of it. Um, <laughs> just this is, some of the zap plays were so insane. Yeah. But I feel like he had a couple good plays in the in the second game. Was that the was he Donza? Was the second game the Donza game? It was Heim the second. Or Heim, game, yeah, he had so. a couple good Heim Heim alts. I remember, but yeah, yeah. He, he is a good Heim. I think in general, he's just kind of that character. Yeah. Um, Something I would want to touch on a little bit in the quarterfinals, I think we have talked about this topic before. When we were done our set and we started prepping for you guys, we had the discussion of, oh, well, what did they hide or what they didn't they hide? 
and I kind of know how you are a little bit for this of, I don't think either of us believe, I used to do it and I learned my lesson mm -hmm. of hiding picks. And I tried to say like, most teams don't hide stuff anymore. Like I was pretty yeah. sure like when you guys picked like Sobek, Pos, ba, or so, Sobek, Pos, Sobek, Bog, Vulcan, I was like, that's probably what all of them want. Like that's probably like their three like top picks for them. Because why wouldn't you use those games to like try to win cleanly and practice and warm up on a character that you think you're going to keep playing? Like it just makes more sense to do that than like, oh, we're just going to play random characters that none of us are going to actually play. Like, so I, I always think that's interesting because if you listen to like the desk and stuff before our set, there's a lot of like guessing games of like, yeah. oh, well, like what have we seen from the ferryman or like, you know, like. Both our quarterfinals were like kind of sloppy, like, oh, are they like hiding stuff and all this? I always think it's a little funny. Yeah, yeah. No, I feel like we we played like all the stuff that we thought were thought was good for the most part. Yeah. Um I mean the only pick that I was playing, I guess, that I didn't play in the tournament was RDO. I was actually playing RDO a good bit before the tournament. She felt pretty good. You know what's funny about that? Yeah. There was a scrim shortly after the tournament where we played a double block and we played the Levi's and we played the Ravens mm -hmm. on both of those blocks in that day. And in a separate game, they both Ronnie and Hurry both top two to RDO. <laughs> yeah, and I, I was running it on them every and game. I, I played and I was it. like, <laughs> one, Ronnie playing RDO <laughs> makes no sense. I've never seen that guy play RDO. And they both, I just counterpicked both of them and they absolutely sprinted and entered the game. They just got killed off cooldown. Yeah. And I was so confused. And I was like, who the hell is playing RDO? It doesn't make sense. And they're like, oh, maybe Aurora. And I'm like, of course, like Aurora is probably playing RDO or something like that. It's like, it's yeah. weird. Like, you can get a guess from people playing other stuff. Yeah. Like, the, you know, even though you're on the same side of the bracket and we don't play each other. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you guys had moments like that. But yeah, for sure. Like yeah. with, with Afro, was like yeah. we, everybody knew that Afro was like a hot commodity going into the tournament. Yeah, and like, like I'm sure like Gene practiced it against you guys yeah. a bit and stuff. Yeah. yeah, and Rangyu a little bit too. I played a little bit as well, but I just like I wasn't I wasn't feeling it. Like I didn't like how mm -hmm. I was playing it. I, it was broken though. It was, it was probably the best support pick in the tournament, I feel like. That was my opinion. Yeah. But it, it is. That character gave me so many like ups and downs this season like, yeah i know i you stuck with it though i, I gotta respect that i loved her so much like and i wanted to play her for years yeah and trying to explain to people how i wanted to play it and then when she got buffed and then my team didn't want to play it the way that i thought was good to play it because like i don't know how you feel about like kepri for example but mm -hmm. in my opinion like playing against kepri i think it's it feels worse to play against a team with kepri when like their assassin can go in and you just can't kill them, they just do a million damage. You have to use all of your relics, and then they get to reset the fight because they have a Capriot. Like, I hate the feeling of being against that, and that's kind of how I saw Afro. Of like, if I have like a Susano and they go in and they just trust me that I am going to up them when they try to kill you, like the game is so hard for their carries. Like being on the other side of that, mm -hmm. like they don't know if they have to turn on you and kill you. Yeah. But they can't really kill you, and then they have to relic, but they have to relic like so precisely because i'm giving you like 20 percent damage increase and you just one shot um yeah like we didn't really end up playing it that way so i had to like let go of how i wanted to play the character and learn to play it the way our team could be successful with it and then yeah like sticking through it the season was like kind of tough but it was definitely worth it yeah no it was, it was good like i should have probably played it a little bit more and practiced it i feel like looking back but i was happy with so like sobek was good into it as well i feel yeah, I like think sobek was just a really yeah solid pick. it was the best pick into it like by far and then like Ardio was like my the second pick that was like pretty good into it i felt like but everything else did you, you think just get Ardio demolished in i didn't play Ardio in your set in no the no set. did you think about it like in draft did you think about picking mm, it no mm. just because the so the Ardio. so okay so the reason why I added RDO is because every game, um, I think the reason why we did so well when we came back is I was playing Sobek and a lot, and it was going like because I didn't play Sobek at all. I don't think in the in the second phase um, of SPL, like maybe I played you it week a lot one or week two. Yeah, the first couple of weeks you played it a lot, and then maybe you know. I don't know if I I think I played it a lot the entire first phase and at the end especially. But I maybe I played it in like the first. I probably played it at least in the first or second week, but as soon as people started playing like Ryzen and stuff, that god was yeah. That's when you stopped. It yeah. was terrible. 
<laughs> I was like, I'm not. If they're Alpwash and Raiden, I'm, Sobek's not a good character. It's like better when they like have more tanks on the other team, not mages. For sure, yeah. So, but um, yeah. So I was. They were just. I, it was. Ba- it was perma banned. Like again, like the Warriors and Leviathans. They banned it every single game against mm-hmm. us. And I think the only games we ever won against the Warriors was that like the first week when I was playing Sobek against them, and then. Okay, this is a guy I want to talk about too. Is when they played Ganesh, we won three games. I thought Ganesh was so bad. I'm so mad that I picked it in game four still because I feel like you guys crushed. We could talk about the semifinals now. You guys crushed us every single laning phase. Like, I think every single game, like game one, game two, game four, and game five, you guys completely blew us out on the duo side of the map. The only game we did well was when you were playing Ganesh in game yeah. three. Like, in the actual laning phase portion of the game, like, every other game, you you guys completely you, dominated you duo. When, okay, so what was game one? Was it Sobek Yamoja? I think it was Sobek Yeah, Sobek Yamoja, Yamoja yeah. And, and you guys it had Sobek Afro, and then it was Sobek Ganesha. Yeah. And then you played Ganesha, and I played Afro, I think. Yes. And then you it was went back Sobek, to Sobek, and yeah. it was Kepri. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's exactly what it was. Yeah, so, like, that set, like... I, I know a lot of, like, I was listening to some people, like, analyze it. I think Hazer was talking about it. And, like, I'm trying to remember who else I was watching watch back the set. But people were like, they should have made adjustments to pick more pressure. But in my mind, Sobek was the most pressure I, I, thought Sobek I could pick. for you guys in the like, lane, for sure. Like, that, like I was trying to pick for, for lane because I knew Afro was going to be played. It felt pretty good against Afro, like, every game I played. I remember we killed... We killed multiple Afros in the laning phase multiple times of playing. So, like, we killed you, I think, in game two. Yeah, yeah. You but it didn't matter. Like, you, you guys were... like Ishtar, I think? Yeah, yeah, you guys were so far ahead that the kill did not matter still. Like, you guys were still crushing us that lane. Like, that just... That kept us afloat, like, in the game state, I feel like. Mm-hmm. Getting that kill, it wasn't like, oh, we won lane off that. Like, we just got a kill. Because I remember I was talking to Coast, and he was saying, oh, you killed it. I'm like, you guys crushed us, like, every laning phase. And he was like, oh, you killed us game two. And I'm like, it, it didn't matter. You guys were so far ahead. Like, it, that kill didn't really do anything other than keep us, like, keep Cyclone in, in a good spot, like, yeah. in terms of, like, the rest of the map. The duo meta was really yeah. weird uh, this year to me. Like, because it, it kind of went through waves, in my opinion, almost of what the junglers cared about. Because at the start of the year, yeah. prop off was just way better than cooldown buff. It wasn't even close. Mm-hmm. And everybody would do get mid pressure at like one minute, and then you'd come shield buff side. And then it was kind of like, even if you were winning duo, if your mid jungle was losing, you kind of had to give up prop buff. And I feel like the mage meta was the only meta where people started to prioritize the cooldown buff because I think yeah they buffed it to give more XP. And then, like you said, like that lane was just more volatile. Like one of those mages being ahead was so oppressive to like the other jungler yeah. and just, just everybody. The, like, everybody on the map. They basically. started rotating. It was impossible to kill them. Like mm-hmm. all that type of stuff. And then once the mages got nerfed, I felt I felt like people would play the duo side of the map much heavier. But it was it became kind of odd because once metas are more yeah defined, like for example with Sobek, like something I thought was really good about him as well is. A jungler doesn't really want to come over and like try to gank a Sobek that much. Like you're pretty hard to kill, and normally like most ADCs like they're not going to give you that gank, especially in a real game. They're not just going to give you the chance to gank them when they know you have mid pressure. And I feel like Duo got in this weird spot where after that initial shield buff, junglers never really did the play where like early in the year people would just do it to get a first blood where they'd sit there for like 30 seconds yep. and they just wouldn't back for their second back harpies. And they would just be like, oh, let's see if they play up. And then eventually, like, you know, people will just be lazy and they'll play up and they'll give you a first blood. But later in the year, I feel like junglers kind of gave up on that. And it was like a really defined rotation of like, we go mid, we clear two waves, we do duo side mid harpies, you do prop buff, you back, you, back, you go to your back harpies. Yep. And then if you have the prop exactly. buff on you, you invade blue is like yeah. the general like formula people wanted to follow. So what I had kind of felt like is when we got into that spot, whenever we had a really strong level three. I just didn't care what the matchups were that much. Like the Sobek Afro thing to us, I felt like worst case scenario, I feel like they have like Sobek Wheelix and I just like have to buy beads. Like I'm just trolling, I'm inting if I don't buy beads sort of mm. thing. But I kind of felt like we're just going to clear better and we're just going to poke better. And as long as I don't literally troll and die <laughs> the way I did in game two, um, I just felt like it puts you in a, a pretty good spot. So like all of our duo lanes, like, I think one of the reasons we liked on her, and I think a lot of people banned on her from us in general, like after we got coast, 
the main reason that I liked it is because it gave us buff secure on level three. So like, I mean, it was OP for Pro as yeah. well, like impaled secure on Pro. That's what I, that, because I, we had a conversation about that as well. Like, I was like, is there any other god like on her that could just secure the buff as the hunter, like yeah. on Pro? Like, because he was the best. Like, if you pulled Pro, it was just instant. Yeah, you get it. Like, is on her. Like, yep. unless you're trolling, basically. So, yeah. yeah, that's how we felt too. So we just felt like we could do every Pro and we could go to your purple. And as long as we didn't think we could literally die from, like, a mid laner rotating or something, well, it's 50-50 it. And if we get it, your hunter is feeling so much worse. Like, yeah, because now we can zone you when we're level 5 and you're level 4. Like, mm -hmm. it just opened up so many plays. Like, you know, the, the other thing that I think from a spectator they probably don't think as much as the players do, supports normally back, like, a wave or two before the ADCs. Like, we have Thebes before they have devs. Yep. So when your support backs earlier... And then I'm coming out of base and your hunter doesn't have time to clear the wave and then back and get devs. When I can stop that guy's back, it's so you're getting bad. behind yeah, like yeah. every 30 seconds you're behind like six or more stacks, depending if jungle buffs are up. Yep. And then your hunter now is in the spot where like you can never fight the other guy. Yeah, you, you can never fight. And if the two of us rotate to mid harpies, like something I valued with Coast was like, if you and I rotate to go to contest mid harpies with our team, and I knew Coast was ahead in stacks, like I just know he's gonna win the one v one. So like now he's in the spot where again like he can go coin flip their purple in a one v one, or he can go. He did that against Roy like in our game five. He didn't get any kills. No fights happened near him. He was just like three levels up because he just coin flipped everything. And it was Hachi versus Ishtar. The Ishtar is never out securing a Hachi mount on a buff, so he would just go there and coin flip it. They had one play. They tried to TP to kill him, and he just Hachi ulted out. And he's just That's done. why Hachi was so good. Yep. Yeah, and I just think small plays like that were a really big deal. It, it was interesting because in the semifinal for our set, we had a big discussion of, I think we actually wouldn't have played on her that much against you guys because we did it the last tournament. And I, I said it early on, like at the start of the podcast, I just felt like your laners were really good at not giving us mistakes or opportunities to snowball through. And we just felt like every game against you guys, we felt like unless one of the teams really made a big mistake and gave the other one an opening we just felt like every game would go to team fights like yeah we would like see efgs every game and like we would play late game so that was kind of what we had learned was that we tried to play him on like i think we played bog against you guys maybe like or maybe that was no we played no, jing we played hachi a lot yeah we played hachi and jing i was so i was so happy when you guys picked jing i'm not gonna lie like i was like uh, i was like dude if he, that character is yeah. broken i'm not kidding no i, I think he's broken i think she's good too but i feel like for you guys to beat us like um like you guys had like the mismatch and do it like i feel like you guys were like if we could survive the dueling phase like against your like against your team i felt like we were in a really good spot like like we didn't have to beat you guys we just didn't needed to not get blown out on that side of the map yeah. and i feel like you guys blew us out like almost every game anyways besides like maybe game two yeah and like game three <clears throat> but game one i think you guys did a really good job of blowing us out. Like we, you, like I think I that think was like Coast had. Game, right? We got a really good start that game. I think Coast had two levels like every single game basically. Yeah. Besides the game you were Ganesh, and the, I think we were like even that game. But we yeah, I felt like um, just in general, I felt like characters who could secure camps and be safe were really good in duo. Like I actually kind of hated playing with, like for example, I kind of hated playing with Heim a little bit, which. Like, Coast liked it a lot, or, like, Rama was actually a bigger thing, because yeah. both Vote and Coast liked Rama a lot, and I just felt like it felt really bad to play with a character where their support can just walk to our buff at level three, and it's, like, it's so much pressure on me. Like, I have to play this so well to, A, like, have secure us not lose there. creeps because their ADC is pushing the wave in, and then also secure the buff and, like, have nothing. It just felt so bad. Like, yeah. It, you just never want to be in that spot where, like, if you mess up or lose the coin flip, you're just so far behind. So yeah, I kind of hated characters like that for that reason. I was surprised, like, I was surprised other people didn't play Jing or on the other side of it. Like, I was saying uh, on stream the other day, like, I was actually most worried about the Warriors playing, like, Izanami into us. Because I thought it was really good into my picks. Because in scrims, the time we struggled the most was... I just play a lot of, like, healing characters, I guess. So yeah, like, and you would go Tainted. I, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'd play, like, Afro and Sylv and Yamoja or whatever else. Um, we had a couple scrims. I'd play, like, you know, like, Baron or Hell and, like, you know, anti-heal against those characters. Could too. And if Izzo just goes Tainted, like, 
she's a safe character. Just having a jump makes you safer in general. And then also having tainted, like we just couldn't play the lane at all. Like we could not fight them, could not clear them. So I was actually more worried about that. And I felt like when we were playing against characters like Hachi, like even though we thought I thought he was the best hunter, like overall, yeah. Um, even playing against them, I was like, at least I know what I'm gonna get a little bit. Like, That's how I like, felt too yeah. with Hachi. That's why we we probably should have prioritized him a little bit higher, like in our draft. But like I felt the same way, like. I don't really care if they're Hachi. Like, you kind of you kind of know what to expect against a yeah. Hachi mon. But he's just the thing about Hachi is that he's just he's always gonna be strong like in team fights no matter what. We had talked about that with uh, yeah. Sobek too actually because I kept bringing it up like before the set I even brought it up like should we like write down some drafts where like we ban it if we think it's a problem or whatever. And we would talk about it after all the games of like you know do we want to put him on something else? And the discussion we always had was like even though we thought like. Even though we felt like it was a good pick and it was good into stuff that we wanted to play, it was just like at least we like like we know how to play against it. Like at least we know what he's gonna end up being on, sort of thing. And it is weird to feel that way about like a character like Hachi or Sobek, where like you know they're a good pick, like yeah. you know they're strong, you know the other players are good at them as well. But there's something about it being known. I think I think on that topic, I think everyone has probably asked you this as well, but I'm curious in game five. When we were in our bottom two bands, yeah, I had brought up Alaron and Freya because that was the first game you guys played set without Mama. I thought Momo. you guys were gonna ban it. I yeah. I brought up banning. I was like, I promise you, Spin is gonna play one of these. Yeah, and we were. I think I forget what we banned. I, well, I thought you guys were gonna ban Freya because I, I yeah. that I didn't think you were gonna ban Alaron. That, that's yeah. what we had talked about. As I said, but that's what I thought you guys were gonna ban. I I'm way more concerned about spin because he was gonna play Freya. he was gonna play Chronos if we if you ban Freya I I, that, yeah. I thought about Chronos before yeah. Alaron like I yeah said, like, he's so if you guys ban Chronos or Freya both of those then would have been probably really bad but I I thought you guys would only ban Freya if you were gonna ban yep. one, one of them yeah that's probably right yeah because I because who cares about Chronos at all? what the Chronos I, either of them yeah we played Freya the last like the two day period and mm. same with Kronos. Oh nice. Yeah, because that's when we started playing set. We started playing set really late into that. Yeah, that, so. that's actually pretty interesting. Yeah. I thought Kronos was I brought him up to vote. I think he got a buff at some point, but mm -hmm. I actually thought he was kind of an underplayed ADC pick. Cyclone thought he was bad, Kronos, but he wanted to Paul really like set and that was like the other mage yeah. that he was like okay playing other than yeah. Freya basically but he thought Freya was good but yeah that, that was a problem for us too because Dardas loves his like hunters or other random yeah. picks and it was really hard to find magical elsewhere like we played a lot I don't think we ended up playing at Worlds but we played a lot of the last couple of days we played like Cthulhu and Yorm games just to like, see like can we get a magical like somewhere to you know balance it out a little bit um I don't think we ended up ever going to it but yeah yeah because in that game five like did you guys think about the Erlong? Yeah, we did. That's we thought funny, we thought yeah. about it the game, the first game. We thought about playing it. Set. Yeah, we thought about playing it. Was it, it game two? Game one? one we, game one, we picked yeah. Zeus, and we 10th picked Zeus. Yeah. And we thought about picking Erlong, and we decided to not do it on game I'll, one. Yeah, Zeus was... I mean, we, we knew that Erlang... Was a high possibility. Like that was one of the things we talked about going into the set is that he's probably going to pick Erlang, and we were we all were like, if he plays Erlang, let him. Like we wa we wanted him to play Erlang basically. Yeah. Like we we're happy because we just thought in team fights he's just not going to be as good. As well, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, Dardis played it really well though. I, like in game five, and it worked out really good. Like he had some really insane <laughs> taunts in team fights, but if he was those like, fights were so close. They like were, in game yeah. five, like. Oh, I hate thinking about it. It's so bad. But yeah, there's so many bad, like so many close plays that if we just did one of them, it could have easily gone the other way. But I feel like, like, I think he had two fights. There was like one in the FG pit where he got a double taunt that was like insane, and then there was like another one I forget where else. But it was like a pyro fight. Yeah, maybe? I I can't remember exactly. But he had, he had two fights where he got and it it was just really good. And then like when we chased him or when Baskin chased him down that one time and he got the kill on him, he had a really good game on it for sure. But we were we were all happy if he played it. Like we were like. We were not worried because we could have banned it. We talked about banning it in the bottom too. Yeah, because the, the only pick that was surprising, I guess, was the Zeus. That's it. Mm -hmm. Like that was like I didn't even think about the Zeus, and I didn't want to play against it again after game one actually because it felt like we couldn't end the game because of Zeus. That comp so well, like we had that discussion of like, yeah, because I, I think we could have picked like maybe Merlin or Tiamat or something was up, and we could have picked it. And we talked about like if there's a game where we're gonna try Zeus, like maybe it should be this one. And normally in scrims, 
we would only play Zeus if I was Afro or Kepri. It was just kind of like, you know, just, yeah. it's just like a band-aid fix to Zeus a little bit. Like, those just easy combos. Um, and in that comp, we thought, like, there was, like, Rat, Set, Wukong, and all of those characters, like, their ideal fight, they kind of want to all in, like, when they have the window to. And we kept trying to, like, give you guys bait a little bit. And there was one fight especially... It was at an uh, like an EFG fight at like forty minutes, and Paul two won Dardes and did like forty yeah. percent of his health, and we were like, for sure this is a fight they're gonna like dive and try to kill us all, and you guys just did not do it. And Paul and Baskin specifically played that game so well, like it felt yep. like they never gave us a chance to actually turn on them and like play front to back and kill you guys. They like, yeah, you, you guys just played that comp so well. Like once that because we had the discussion from. You guys played set against the Scarabs, I believe, into Thoth. They picked Thoth, and you guys played set Maman. Yeah. And we have the discussion of, like, oh, it's probably they only do that into Thoth. That, like, seems like a like an obvious counter. And then when you guys did it against us, we were like, oh, so, like, maybe they just, they just like, set men in general. Like, we just like, yeah, we just, just liked it. Paul's really good at it as yeah. well. And then I was like, oh, okay, that makes sense. Like, it's one of Paul's, like, best characters. And then when you guys played it like that, that game, I was like, okay, like, not only are they comfortable picking it into more than Thoth, but, like, they're also just really good with this comp. Like, they've definitely practiced it a lot. Yeah. That's how it felt to us. I mean, honestly, like, we only practiced it the two days, but, I mean, we practiced it a lot, like, the whole year because he played yeah. set, like, multiple times, so we are very comfortable playing it, and he felt like it was really good with the Axe buff. Like, he wanted to try it when Axe got buffed, yeah, like, at the start, but he just... We didn't know where we wanted to put our magic at as well, and then Sino decided he he liked Maman a lot. Like he he was just playing her a ton. And he's like, he was like he was like on the fence if he liked her or not. But he ended up liking her like a lot. Like the last couple of weeks, like of scrims, like mm -hmm. even though we weren't winning a lot of games with it, he still was like this character feels good. In like most of the games I play it. So then Paul's like, okay, I'm gonna try some set games basically, and then it ended up just being really good. One of my favorite things about Comp Smite in general is talking about like that game five draft for example it's so funny to me when from the outside like you guys pick freya that like you guys i think won the first tournament on freya like spin kind of brought her back a little bit yeah um, and he's always been so good at that character and same thing with like paul on set like yeah we played like erlong into set a couple other things was just a matchup that we liked for how we wanted to play and there were just so many small things like it's funny that both teams like you can read the other one and know, like, oh, this is, like, what their players like, or these are things they could do or they might do. And from the outside, they're like, oh, like, I can't believe they picked this, or no way they, like, picked this or that or whatever. And in our head, like, we're having the discussion of, like, we know they're going to do it, but do we actually care if they do it? Like, I, I love that yeah. little, like, chess match almost. Yeah. The other thing we talked about, I guess, um, that we didn't play in the set, but I think it's through Paul. I was talking to Paul about this recently. You just thought it was not that good. Was that was Baba? Because usually when we played Baba against you guys, it went yeah, pretty I thought well. Yeah, you guys would play it. Yeah, like it felt like whenever like there was a couple teams like you guys and the Warriors Did especially. We game one, we might have banned it. We yeah, but, we had a lot yeah, of drafts where we were like yeah. we're banning Baba if they're playing it. You know. Yeah, because you guys and the Warriors especially for some reason like Baba always just was insanely good against i don't know why it just felt really good like every game yeah. so like we talked about it but like that's one thing that we didn't bring up on stage was the baba but i think it's to paul said at the end of the day he just he didn't know how good she was really because she got nerfed she got that one nerf so it was like he was like whatever on it but that was like the one god i guess that we we didn't really talk about that much that i guess we could have played in all the drafts but like my god pool like was literally so big Ardio and then Charon and then I was gonna play Afro if it was if it felt like we were like you just had in a bad spot like if we were yeah. down 2-0 like maybe I would pick it like if it felt like it was just dominating every game and we couldn't ban it but yeah mm -hmm. those were like my three gods I was gonna go to that tournament but and I knew Sobek if like I didn't really think about the later rounds but I know from playing against Levi's and the Warriors, there was a good chance Subek was getting banned, so that's why I was thinking I'd probably play RDO, but it didn't get banned, so that's why I kept playing it. Did you um did you go blink every game you played RDO? I didn't go blink, no. I went I went med and bracer mm. every game, I think. Yeah. I think I just went med bracer and almost everything. I think I went Ankh in one of the game in game one against you guys when I was Sobek when you were Yamoja. 
I would sometimes go a different relic. Like sh I would go shell as well if they had. Um, I didn't go med. I went. I went shell onk in game one. I would go shell instead of med if they had like a cage or something because people were playing a lot of Odin as well. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I was just curious because in the past when you played RDO, it's been a lot of like blink, yeah, blink horrific engages, like stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. So I was kind of curious. That, that makes sense though. I think this was probably the first tournament where. I didn't have a pretty defined god pool because normally I'll be between like I'd say like three and six is my sweet spot where yeah. like there's normally like one character like let's say Yamoja the past few years there's normally a character like that where I'm like anytime it's open you can pick it but it's probably banned a lot of games and then I'd be like these two characters I'll pick literally anywhere in a draft you can blind pick it wherever like kind of how you were with Sobek like if people want me to first pick it I'm happy to if people want me to second third it I don't care that's fine and then there'd be like a couple like Counter pick situational counter pick, yeah, sort of thing. Yeah, this tournament was like, I was like, I think Afro is better than every other character, and then it was literally like a list of like, I'm not even kidding, like, I probably scrimmed with like 30 gods, which normally I think is really bad. I still think it's really bad to do that, honestly. But the, I, I think the weird thing with not weird thing, but our team, I think, if we were ever going to like be successful, it was off of me and Darda's like pivoting our play styles kind of like we'd have games where we're like Mori or Erlong mid or like he played like Pele or Athena or Cab mid like we've had a bunch yeah. of like random picks like that like that is kind of our cue of like we're gonna run it down and Mike will play like Atlas or I'll play you know whatever else it might be where I just like really want to get in there or we would have the exact opposite like game one against the Warriors we like we kind of learned this from you guys I don't know if this is ever like a spoken thing that you guys do in comms, but from the outside, we would watch a lot of your guys' tournament games and it felt like Spin especially was really good at farming for a 3K pot and then when he had it, you guys would fight off of it, I felt like a decent amount or like, especially when he was bog, it would like, he would like split push the whole game, get a 3K pot and then you guys would put bombs on him, like against us game one, I think you did it. like he would take the bombs and then go split push and then he can just backdoor phoenixes like if yeah. we gave him an opening for it stuff like that yeah he liked he liked doing that and then he liked taking the bombs for fg secure because he yeah. liked pulling fg as well and then just yeah like we did it i think it was game one game, two where we like yeah, soloed it basically yeah, yeah we just we four man zoned you guys while yep. he did it just because we that's primal fury is so broken like if you get two primals you can do you can't do that without primal fury so yeah it was like Primal Fury was super good. So if we were able to get Primals, we were able to make plays like that. Yeah, your which guys' was really macro good. With, that's yeah. That's why we ended up banning it because your guys' macro with Bog, it just was so, it was so hard to play against because the amount of, you guys were just way better at us at actually grouping for like beacons, Primal Furies, Pyros. Like literally, like at forty minutes, you guys like knew that it could change the way you would play your comp. And like actually valued it a lot and we just were pretty lazy around it honestly yeah be beacon like i think like i would i would talk about baskin <laughs> this is another thing baskin would always meme me and damage and sino OP, but i'm man. like we should play like beacon so i think at the end of the year or at the end of it i think i valued pyro more but i was like i was all aboard the beacon hype train I'm like we should play for every single beacon and try, just try to get it every single time like yeah. we should be there at 12 minutes like i would get mad in games like i'm like everybody needs to say beacon it's some like people need to be talking about when beacons coming up like we would talk about like beacons coming up in two minutes like paul would say it or like sign would be like beacons in a minute or like do you want me to rotate like, we would always be talking yeah. about beacon because Usually in the early game, we were not a team that made like a lot of plays around the map. Like we didn't do a lot of buff invades unless we won. A yeah. Like we we would only be super aggressive in the early game if we got. Um, I felt like you guys early were, kills yeah, basically you were in the lane. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Like if we if we like in the laning phase, like in the laning phase in Smite is like the first like, I'd say it's like what what is it like four minutes probably like once the second prot spawns like the laning phase is over like after that prot's over like the first prot and then the second prot and then that's the whole laning phase like if we got kills anywhere on the map um then we would play aggressive like on that side of the map if we didn't we would just be happy just taking our own buffs and like our point of contention would be like we want to fight at beacon and if they don't show up at beacon we just take it for free basically and then just go back to farming but yeah. but but to your three K pot thing, um, that's something we talked about all year because we we always thought three K pot was just broken. Yeah, so like, like we wanted like in fights like if the game went late like 
we would purposely farm like Paul and but Paul as well. Like Paul and Cyclone, like we would want them to get three K pots before we'd fight. Like if they were close, basically, and like Cyclone wouldn't even upgrade his relics or his um, his glyphs to just get three K pot. And then the other thing too is Paul. Paul would only upgrade his relics. Like if we, he was against like Dodge, he would and rank his like beads to like beads yeah, TT yeah. beads. Yeah. But other than that, like he, like both of them wouldn't upgrade their relics, and they would more prioritize three K pot like over everything else. So Epi, the like Worlds qualifier tournament, not the one right before Worlds, but like the f November one, whatever you, it was called. I don't know. Like basically the Phase Two playoffs. Yeah. At that tournament, I made a couple fire giant calls that like I really hated in the moment, and it felt like kind of forced because we had like a kakalkin and we're like oh well we need to secure and like we think we have a big enough window where they're like far enough back that we can just do it and get out and we ended up having a couple plays where like just any of us dying i felt like was bad to do that type of play and then give them control of the map and then i would watch your guys set against uh, we watched our set against you guys back and we watched your set against the levi's and it looked really obvious to me that you guys were playing for 3k pots so we had scrims where we would literally have games, and I'm like, if this was a quote-unquote real game, I want to take literally zero risk here. They can't do fire in front of me and Darda's. You guys should literally just be farming. Like, just go farm, get 3K pots, go do whatever. Um, and if we're here, they can't do fire. Like, they can't stop an Africa Kalkin from walking in, and I'll just make sure he can alt it. Like, I'll just make sure he's in range to alt it, and that's it. And we literally game one against the Warriors, like, I was pretty happy with our team because we literally went into that game with a plan of we felt like we had stronger lanes because we were Afro and Ganesha, yeah. so I knew we would win duo. And I think we counterpicked solo as well. So I, I just knew like we had two winning side lanes, so I'm like, we have plays if we want to take them, but I would just keep stressing in games like we don't have to do anything. Like we can just play for beacons, play for bombs, play slow, and we're going to get 3K pots and we can win the game. And it was kind of like we had to learn that off of you guys kind of because we would – against the Warriors, I don't know if it's fair to say this, but that they were like kind of antsy. But they had – you could feel playing against them that they were annoyed because they wanted to fight us. We didn't give them a fight, and then they felt like they couldn't do fire because Dardas and I would just sit there and we could just kick Hawk and alt it if yeah. you were low enough. And I think the feeling of games like that, it's probably so boring – to yeah. watch as a spectator, but I love playing games like that where you're just like, you just know what you're playing for. Yeah. And you're like, come on, do it already. Yes, yes. And like literally, like, come on, come on. Within a 30 second <laughs> window, you can see like we traded the way people would farm the jungle. And within a 30 second window, we sent last Dardes and Coast to back, and all three of them bought 3K pots. And we made sure the other team didn't see us on vision, like in our jungle. And then we popped them at the same time and just went. And then just, like, fought them and just won the fight off of it. And yeah. it, it's just so troll to do it, but I really love it. You know, it's, it's – the 3K pot was broken. <laughs> like, there's so many points. I mean, this year, if you watch any cycling, cycling games, especially in Chernobog, like, if you have 3K pot and crit and you alt in, you start hitting for, like, a 1,000, yes, especially dude. with beacons. Like, if you have, like, three or four beacons with 3K pot, you're literally – crushing people for like a like a thousand crits it's Dude, ridiculous there was a play against the levi's when you guys beat them i think it might have been game five he was bog and you guys literally get fire and he alts from the fire pit to shinto at like a speed buff and he literally autos him once before shinto turns the corner and then he twos him and it's like 1k yeah. 900 and shinto's like one hp and it was so close and it was just like that is just that so happened broken. so many times this year when he was bog like just in regular spl games too just one shotting people is that's why it was so broken yeah but yeah no we definitely had conversations about 3k pot and how op it was and like if people were close to 3k pot like we would want we would want to wait before we actually took a fight yeah getting I, 3k pot i think stuff like that was probably the weirdest thing for me on this team where I would have discussions like that when I'm playing, like Twig was the the easiest teammate with this type of stuff that he probably felt, we would both think about stuff in that way where we would just be like, every single beacon's OP or like, uh, for example, you remember the, um, the like gold chalice at like speed buff? Yeah. Like Twig wasn't jungling that year, Sam was, but we had multiple discussions with me and Twig where we'd be like, Sam, like, that thing cannot overcap. Like, we're never letting that overcap. Like, we are always proccing that. I don't care. Like, we would tell Alec, too. We're like, Alec, I don't care if you have to, like, clear your wave and give up pressure. Like, 
we're not letting this thing overfill literally ever because we're just going to make sure we're like min-maxing the gold from it or like same thing with beacon i would say like like even the movement speed version i'm like you guys know how op it is like literally the ability the movement speed version was so broken literally yeah. the ability to walk to fire giant and ward and be able to back and get there quicker like even small stuff like that can change a game entirely like being able to rotate lane to lane is such a big deal literally like something with war flag that i had kind of stolen from you as well because i would go back and forth a lot between like i still think compassion's really good compassion but also was really good but war flag was just broken in my opinion like yeah exactly yeah i basically came to that conclusion where cherry asked me because i was buying it every single scrim and he's like do you never think it's good to do another thing i'm just like the amount of value that we are getting from literally clearing a wave and walking to our camps quicker or clearing like a camp and walking the lane quicker and getting pressure off of that or we can clear a mid wave and we can get to oracles before they can contest us or we can do like all of these small things are like if you fight us in a lane like let's say it's like a beacon fight at like 23 minutes like before the titan spawns yeah. if the tier one towers are down and you take a beacon fight and i have war flag and you don't and we clear a wave and we end up chasing someone down and getting a kill because of the movement speed. Mm -hmm. If that means we get fire giant or something, like it's literally game winning. Like on the spot, you can just win a game off stuff like that. It's so hard to like contextualize the value of small buffs like movement speed, power, primal fury buff, like yeah. all those small things. The other thing too is like um I guess some primal fury buff too. Like I know for the people listening, um, the thing that's broken about Primal Fury is that you take less damage from objectives. So you take less damage from fire. That's what makes it broken. Like, it's not the damage that you're doing. That's why, like, as a hunter, you're able to solo it if you have two of them. If you have three of them, it's so easy. Like, you, you know, you're never going to die. Like, you're, you can out lifesteal the damage with two primals because you just don't take enough damage from it to die. But, okay, but the other thing I wanted to talk about was... Um, with war flag the reason why i swapped to going war flag so much <coughs> was because once they they bug fix war banner yep and that was like my green light i'm like okay i'm gonna buy it every game now because the reason why i didn't like it um it would it wouldn't work late game like it would like it would randomly break in the middle of the game like i played it i played it you war flag so much in arena with like just moswell yep. or just in general like even the old version of war flag back in like season nine and eight but like this version too, I played a lot of it and I hated that War Banner would break because it felt so strong late game when it actually wasn't broken. And when they bug fixed, I'm like, okay, this item is so good now because the thing that would happen is like whenever you hit someone, you get you get refresh on your stacks and you heal and give everybody mana as well. So like gods like Ardeo, for instance, that's the reason why I thought she was good. She's like one of the best war banner users sure. in the entire game. Like you're wanting people, you're hitting multiple people with your one. You you can hit everybody with your three in a team fight and you're getting one war banner like heal off that. There's like one fight where like I think my war banner healed for like because people don't go anti heal like against yep. it like. People aren't thinking about anti-healing war banner, like it healed my like everybody on the on the team, and I have med like some of the games too. Like I'm healing for like a thousand like on everybody in a fight just between war banner and med and like RDO one. It was like insanely OP. Yeah, I don't know if yeah. we played it against you guys, but there was actually I, we still had vote at this point, but there was a comp that I wanted us to practice where we would play. I think it was Ama support in the mage meta with Freya, mm -hmm. and. I wanted to go war flag with, I would rush Shogun's like second item basically. I wanted to go war flag, frenzy, and I would go wing shard. And because I had my ama one, like the Freya would just one shot all the buffs at level one, we'd get to lane quicker. And then basically if anyone tried to fight us, we're just auto attacking for a million because of ama and war banner passive or whatever. And I really thought, I thought it was really broken then as well. And this was before they nerfed Compassion. And the only reason I ended up not doing it was we just... This team wasn't really like a snowball team like that. Like, I felt like if I was playing Ama support, like, I wanted to snowball off objectives. But Dardas wasn't really playing... Kakalkin was the first objective secure character that he played the whole year with us. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until, like, November. But I think, like, looking back, that was probably something we could have done. The other thing about War Flag that was really, really broken, in my opinion, was they buffed Silver Branch. And... Having max stack silver branch was so much power. It was like the highest power item yeah, in the it was game. Good. It was just broken. Um, so yeah, like a lot of our games, we would have 
Nika would buy Shogun's and I would have War Banner and Frenzy ideally if I could get it. And then like Coast would just hit for a million. Like it was just it was just so much damage on your hunter. But yeah. Yeah, no, it was, War Banner is so much fun too. Like it's just a fun item it in is, general. Yeah. Like it, it's good and it's fun, so it makes it <coughs> Really good buy. Yeah, like, like, I assume Spartan Flag. I haven't played a ton of support in Season 11, but I assume Spartan Flag is also... I think it's good. I think War Banner is probably still better, though. Mm. But, it was what I, but maybe... I think, like, with Exodia, like, you get, like, a bunch of beacons. You get, like, three-plus beacons, three K-pop, red buff, Spartan Flag. Yeah, on your mid later with Bracer, like, you can give them, like, so much power. That, that would be good, I, I feel like. I also just love percent damage increase builds. It is the reason that... I also value like Afro really highly. Like, mm -hmm. I just kind of think percent damage increase is like absolutely busted. Like, the fact that you can go like Mirrodin or like Afro off someone, and then their Soul Reaver literally does a percentage of their tank's health, and then that final number is increased by like 50%. <laughs> Your Soul Reaver just hits for like 500 and just one shots them. Like, so be. Yeah, that, that stuff is just really broken. Um, Let's talk about finals. Yeah, I was going to say. So. Going into that set, everybody, I know a lot of people are saying, oh, Levi's or Warriors are just going to win whoever gets uh -huh. it, like, like whoever wins the set like against you guys. But I was like, I don't like, I thought the Warriors were going to win, to be honest, like mm -hmm. for sure against Levi's because I scrimmed both of them. And the, we, like I said, the only time we ever beat the Warriors is when they played Ganesh. You're saying like, like ever. The war, you thought the Warriors would win against Levi's or against us or both? Against Levi's. Oh, okay. So I thought Warriors were going to come out of that side of the bracket is what mm -hmm. I meant. But people were, everybody's like, yeah, the Levi's or Warriors are probably just going to be the Dragon. I was like, I don't know. Like, if, like if the Warriors, if they play the Warriors and the games go late because I thought the Warriors were going to make it, I'm like, I feel like the Warriors will lose. And it's funny, we banned Ganesh against uh, the Warriors, like, every scrim, like, after we beat it a couple times. And I think they beat us a couple times, too. Like, we didn't win every game against Ganesh. Like, they would just beat us still with it sometimes. But we felt like it was the worst practice we were getting, like, ever against that team because we felt like when they played Ganesh... They didn't play the like, way they, they, they yeah, at, in my Yeah, opinion. they didn't try to run run it down and win in, like, 25 minutes, which is what they did. And I feel like maybe us being... <laughs> he came in there like, oh, this is OP. We have to pick it, which is which is funny. I wonder if that's why they picked they, it so much. Well, they fell into the yeah. trap. Do you ever read the balance discord? Because in the balance discord, they lost a set to Ganesha, and Panny literally types, Ganesha is broken. Please nerf him. And every time we scrimmed against that team... Panny would be the one to hover Ganesha, and you know that guy is just telling yeah. genetics to play it every game. That's so funny. But I, we banned it every game against them. Like, literally, it was our first ban, and I think it's so funny. They're like – and I, I, in the back of my head, I'm like, it would be really funny if he just plays Ganesha a lot in the tournament because I feel like they're at their – by far their worst when he played it because they literally own – like, I'm I'm being honest. We I don't think we beat them. Yep. When they were not Ganesh, like maybe we beat them like once or twice. When they were when they were Ganesh, we won like we didn't win every game when they were Ganesh, but it gave us like the games were like the best games we would play against them because we wouldn't get blown out yeah. on the duo side of the map when they were playing it. So I was like, we need to ban Ganesh so we could actually practice against because like we, we need to get better in dual lane at not getting blown out in the lane. And whenever they had Ganesh, the games would always go to team fights and be like, we 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 already you're like that. you know we're, 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 we feel that. good when it gets to that spot. Um, and we're like, I I would I want to just keep playing the lane and just like play against gods that are gonna blow us out in lane and try to figure out how to beat them instead of just get, you know, getting a free pass to late game. It's funny you say that because I'd say against us. The last like couple weeks of scrims, maybe, I'd actually say the Levi's, in my opinion, played better against us. Like, they played like cleaner games or whatever, and we didn't ban any supports against the the Warriors at all. Like, we didn't ban, mm -hmm. and he did play Ganesha a lot against us, <laughs> and I wonder if that like kind of contributed a little bit because we felt like our weakest part of our team was if we did have a bad start, like we had it game four against the Warriors, where like. Coast died, and I don't know who died in solo, but someone died in the 2v2. That was the solo. only game they looked like the Warriors. Exactly, like, yeah. Every other game, they did not look like themselves. Like that, that was like a classic. Like that's If the Warriors played like that every game, they probably would have had a good chance of winning, but they didn't. For so, sure. Yeah. And when we had when we had gone into like Worlds, I was like, it's actually nice for us that, in our opinion, the teams who are going to try to snowball against us would be like, the Levi's of the Warriors. I'm yeah. glad we are practicing against these guys because we will get better at the thing that 
we think we're really bad at, which we Same. did. Yeah. Um, and we, we felt like it was really good prep for us. And then on the other side of that, like, I was surprised they didn't try to do it to us more because, in my opinion, the biggest difference between Jake and genetics on the Warriors is I think the Jake version, in my opinion, was much better at brawling and diving and actually, like, making it feel like you literally could not fight them. And I think the genetics version was better at when they did get those, like, two kills they got against us in game four, like, they just turned their brain off of PvP because they just didn't have to. Like, they had a Vulcan and a Kepri with Shoguns. They just went to every objective and just did it in our face, and we just can't do anything about it. And we just if you have walk to up, up, you die, yeah. Exactly. We just had to give everything up, and it was just a, such a... Games like that just felt awful, but I, I think it's... To your point, I actually thought... And this might just be our perspective. I'm not saying they were worse with genetics. I'm definitely not saying that. But for us, our matchup into that team, we didn't beat them all year. Either version of the team, we didn't beat them all year. But I felt like it was easier for us to play against the genetics version because they were playing less like the thing. They were playing less like the team that exploited our weaknesses and more like just a version of like the Warriors, I guess, where... They're still really talented laners. They're still really good players at, like, fighting and being aggressive and brawling and, like, finding ganks and finding picks and all these things. But they would always, like, in team fights, come to play whatever he wanted them to play like, I kind of felt like. And we had talked about it in the finals. Like, I think Aggro had asked me, asked me yesterday of, like, were you nervous going into game five at all? And honestly, like... I literally thought we had that set one after game one. Like, I wasn't sure how the set would go because we hadn't beat them all year and I didn't know what they would play like. But I think we had a really good read on them because Dardas and I knew they wouldn't ban Afro or Kakalkin. We thought they would, like, ego it is what we said of, like, oh, they're just going to feel like they don't have to ban it. And we also knew we were going to leave Athena open and we knew Genetics was not going to play it because we knew he wanted to play a Peel character. Um, cause he did that, he, forget scrims. He did that to us in both of the last two times we've played them in the SPL. Yeah. They would just put it on panty and then counter pick me on support and then run us down in duo. And we just couldn't play the game because mm -hmm. they just had a global with side lane pressure and we were just screwed. And I would, I, I would be so happy if they played Athena jungle as well. Against sure, us. Like that, that, that was like, especially when he's yeah. playing tank Athena, like if it was damage and he was like split pushing or something, cause like. You can play that character in a damage build with like Polly and yeah. stuff. Like, but when he mm -hmm. was playing as a tank, I was so happy. So like, we knew they wouldn't ban out Dardas and my characters on game one. Like we knew we'd get Afro Kakalkin. We knew they'd play Athena, and we knew they'd put it jungle. And once we had that draft, and we saw how they played the late game, we literally just felt like any game where we don't int, we're gonna get to late game, and we're gonna feel like we're gonna beat them. Is how we felt, and. There were two anomalies, which I would say is uh, game four, we just died in lanes, game was pretty much over, and then game five, we were the ones who ran it down on them, which I think never in a million years would they expect us to play that way against them. But it was kind of funny because we did that to them. We got 3 0 in the set, but there was a game two or a game three where we played Tsukiyomi mid, yeah, and I remember we that. We brawled them off cooldown. We were Suki, Afro, and Dardos, and I mm -hmm. literally just any fight we could take, we took it. And we got like two or three Phoenixes down, and then Nika got picked, and then we all died for him after, and then lost the game instantly. But we had a pretty good idea of like, there are things we can do to like out brawl this team. And I had kind of felt like the version of the team that we played, um, they kind of like, in my opinion, cleaned it up too much almost, where like, they just didn't really play – like, they were really – that team, honestly, was my favorite team to watch ever because they played so free, like, early in the year. Like, they would just play corners you would never think anyone else is going to play, or they would just take two V3s that you think, like, don't make sense to take. Like, I felt like my teams kind of would do stuff like that on, like, Ghost and stuff where we would just fight, but – like, they took it to another level completely. Like, they were just crazy with it. Yeah, no. When, when they were, like, the cr the craziest team. I feel like they, they the, both teams, though, like, with Jake and Genetics, they're just completely different teams. They like are, one, yeah. like, like you said, one team runs it down. I thought they were both really good. Like For sure. But <coughs> I could see why you thought that it would be a better matchup for you guys. Just for our matchup. Yeah. Like, I'm not speaking for them to the rest of the league, but... 
for our matchup against them, it was easier to play the genetics version for us. I think I think it was probably better for us as well. Depending, it's just like with that team. Like if we got blown out by them, it was just bad. I feel like exactly, for us. Yeah. But if we could get to late game, we always felt like we had a good shot at least winning the game. For sure. Yeah. yeah. I think it also, to be fair to them, it also, in my opinion, speaks to how good the other four of those players are that they had two supports with completely different styles. And I think genetics is also like obviously like a big voice in their team and like wants to play through like the way he wants to call the map. Like the fact that they were so good on both versions of those teams and like Daniel goes from playing like blink hebo and one shotting backliners all the first phase to he's playing tma and playing like slow yeah. games and playing patient like those players are just so good and the, the team as a whole was very good in general like they're just it, it, it kind of sucks like that team is obvious like i almost feel bad saying like the whole like we preferred playing against the genetics version because then people are going to use that as like uh oh like they got worse after the roster change and like this and that but i, I just think it sucks like every team can't win, but that was a that was a really good team all year. They were really good. Yeah. They uh, they only lost like not very many stats I feel like this no. entire year cuz they won both the kickoff events, right? They came second in the yeah. Masters tournament to you guys. And they only lost, they lost that set. That was the only set they lost in phase 1 including yeah. the kickoff tournament. They so they lost I, I actually kind of want to count it. They lost the finals in the like spring or summer masters or whatever yeah they won the next kickoff yep they lost to you guys in the regular phase and levi's and the levi's once that yep. was it they were eight and two right yep and then they lost to the levi's at the tournament and then they finished third they beat us so they won out the rest of their sets and they lost at worlds they lost five sets the whole year it's a pretty good year that's crazy yeah that is a good year they lost five sets the entire year yeah that, that is actually incredible that is, that is crazy to think. Like, yeah. we did pretty well, too. We lost more than five sets, though, for sure. We, oh, they lost to the Glads, apparently, people are saying. Oh, yeah, but yeah. that was like... It, was, it that, wasn't they, a real set. It was like a roll They swap roll swaps set. Yeah. that set, so I wouldn't count that, to be fair. Yeah, I'm not counting that. Like, even though it is a loss for them, but it was they roll swapped. It's like not 100%, I feel like. No. I don't know. Wait, so what, what were the teams that beat them? You guys beat them twice. Levi's beat them twice. We beat them once. That's we lost it. to three teams. Yeah, three teams took a set off them the whole year. Yeah, because we we lost to the, I think we lost to the Hounds. We lost to we lost to everybody. I don't know if did we lose to the Glads. I think we lost to everybody besides maybe the Glads. I can't remember if we lost to the Glads in the first phase or yeah. not. No, we did the World Tour. Yeah. We, we stayed loose to everybody. <laughs> we went three and seven the first phase. We went three and seven, and then we went like I don't know five and five, four and six, whatever we were. The second yeah. phase, like it was not good. I mean, it doesn't matter, though. You guys did well in the end. That's all that matters. You know, I, I feel like I'll just share the story for people, but it's when you talked about the Levi's or the Warriors coming out of that set, I'm curious if you've ever felt this way. Um, so season three, like going all the worlds I've made before, okay? It's been every world since season three for me. I didn't make it in season two. Mm -hmm. In season three on Allegiance, we knew, like, realistically, we were probably not going to win that tournament. Like, we were, like, a two-month-old team. Like, obviously, we're trying our hardest, and we believe, but, like, we're literally still having issues of, like, what characters do we play? Like, normally, if you're, like, you don't even know what you want to play or you don't know how to, like, play together, like, we had, like, zero synergy, basically. We just were, like, kind of a new team, and we, like, 5 would the gauntlet, but, like, I never really felt like everybody believed, like, yeah, we can win Worlds. We felt like we could go, like, pretty far, but I don't think, like... When we played Energy, like, we had a couple close games, and I still think we could have won them. But anyways, I'm I'm rambling, but we were definitely not a favorite, and nobody expected us to win. And then when we were on United, even though we were the number one seed in NA, I don't think anyone expected us to win. Like, back then, every EU, like, EU teams had won every single tournament since, like, season two. Mm -hmm. It had been, like, two years. No one, no NA team won. And we had never played the European teams at a tournament. And I feel like everybody wrote us off and nobody thought like we were actually that good. Season five, I'd say like our team was pretty popular. People like thought we had a chance to win like pretty much every year until this year. After season four, I felt like people felt like we had a good chance to win. And I felt like 
there are definitely teammates that I've had that I think bought into the pressure more than others. Yeah. Where I think they really cared about it. And I think because I was fortunate enough where my first two years I didn't feel like people believed in my teams to do well, I just never cared. Like, it just didn't matter to me at all. So, like, this year was an odd feeling in the sense of, like, we're just losing regular season games. We're not good. But every single tournament, we placed top four every tournament. Like, we either made the finals and lost or we were, like, fourth. Like, we'd play the third, fourth place match and get stomped Mm -hmm. by Hounds or Warriors. Um, But we would always, like, get there. And I felt like we'd always, like, stay, like, at least a little competitive. So I felt like we always had a chance. And I remember probably the most – I don't know what the word would be. But I've never felt so confident as I was going into the finals of this world because we played you guys, and emotions were obviously high after that set, just long set. I mean, you get a lot of momentum as well from winning a set like that. For sure. Long set, tough games. Like, we get crowd momentum. I remember talking to our team in our room, and I had said, like, it's already late. I want people to get rest. And I was like, there's no set that was going to be mentally harder for us than that set because we knew all the games would go late we knew you guys are just a tough team to beat like you have to play so clean to actually beat you guys and like you just you can't be lazy on objectives you can't be lazy like with like beacons at 12 minutes for example like you can't give you guys the small wins because you guys would just exploit them more than other teams and i remember that set feeling so hard and i remember saying like i literally i thought back to how it felt when I was on Ghost and Rival, and Ghost especially, we're just like, yeah, whoever we play, we're just going to stomp them. Like, literally the second you guys lost, we're like, yeah, we're going to stomp them. Like, we felt like that was the only other good team. And I, I remembered saying, like, I remember being on the other side of that and seeing the other side have an upset, and it's a team that you've stomped all year, and you think there's no world where we're losing to that team, and you kind of write them off, and... Being on the other side of that was the best feeling ever. Where, like, I just felt like they would just disrespect us and they just didn't believe that they could ever lose to us. And I'm not saying it in a way to talk trash because I think it's good to be confident. And I also think, like, as much. You've been in this spot as exactly. well. And, yeah. and as much hate as genetics gets, it is good that he is, like, a preset trash talker. But, like, even the intro when he's, like, holding up the 3 0, like, it is because they don't think they can lose. Like, I know what it's like to be on that side where you just know that you've owned them all year and you just think there's no chance. I was just curious, like, what your experience has been going into worlds where this year I'd say you guys were a favorite compared to maybe I, I like feel like this year people maybe didn't think that. I feel like the Warriors were still the favorite to win. I, I don't know why. I think it was like, your guys' two teams. Like, I feel like we did we won the tournament or whatever, and, like, and like the Warriors didn't even make the finals, but, like, I have this feeling just from, like, Maybe I don't, maybe I'm just crazy. Like no, I, I think it was like, like the aura. Or yeah, like Twitch was yeah, like pre- a lot like, of people picking the word. Like I feel like everybody just thought we were bad. Like that, but like I'm crazy. Like I always think every year that everybody thinks my team's bad all the time, and everybody thinks we're gonna lose. Like that's how I've always I think felt. That's just the way you stay motivated. Yeah. a little bit. I don't know why, but like every single year, it just feels like whatever team I'm on, like there's some excuse of why we did the, why we won that or yeah, got lucky or, or like, yeah. or like <coughs> the super team thing too. Like, they're, oh yeah, of course they're going to win. Like, and if they, and if they lose like, haha, that team lost, Honestly, like they suck. Like I, like from my experience of playing, like I feel like every tournament I go into, I always think that I'm going to win no matter what. That's what, how I look at it. So when I lose, it always sucks so much because sure. I go into it thinking I'm going to win. Like even in season two, like on COG when I was playing with Kabam and we lost to where they cloud nine back then or whatever. Uh, I think they're wh- whatever team they, the Barrett team that year, I forget if they're cloud nine or whatever. Yeah. But like even that set, like I thought we were going to win and make it to worlds like on a team like that when Everybody thought we had no shot. Like, every team I've been on, every single year, I always think I'm going to win no matter what. And I think um, how I always see people looking at my team is like, oh, they want us. Like, they're like, oh, yeah, I want them to lose so bad. And I love winning because I know it makes all the people that want my team to lose mad when we win. And, like, that's like – it's just such a good feeling to win those tournaments because they're like – 
oh yeah of course they win because they have they have they did this or like they have these players or whatever but yeah like it's just like how i look at it like i've never i feel like you're in a different spot because i feel like your team like that ghost rival team yeah we had like you guys were dominant like on your run for like those like what was it like two three years and then yeah. like it kind of started like the e united year as well like from like season four when you guys won all the way until like the end of like the ghost rival dragon like the first iteration is the dragons yeah. era like all the way through season from season four to season nine you guys were like a dominant force, like I feel like in the regular season. Yeah, I was gonna say regular yeah. season, like we cared yeah. about winning a lot. Like even even the first version of the Dragons mm -hmm. with Hurry, like we won that like spring tournament. Yeah. Like, even like yeah. Yeah, so I feel like you guys were just like always in like you guys were just like a dominant team. So I feel like I feel like all the teams I've been on and I could be wrong about this, like I like the fans for for sure the fan like You know the, the one the, year the, I think you're wrong? Season eight, I think people had you as a heavy favorite because after layers, you guys just won everything. Well, yeah, but I still people hated our team though that year. Oh, so like people hated like I had a bunch of people hate they hate the team. It was funny because layers came. I feel like our team was the most hated team that year at the beginning of the year because of the radiance year because all the all the fallout with that team like it, we didn't do well and like people said bad things about our team. We got a lot of hate going into that season. Um, then we kicked Scary D, and then all those people, oh, yeah. all those people felt validated for the hate that they were giving our team. And then we pick up the person who's most hated already, and Larry's like, "Oh, everybody hates our team because of us." I'm like, "Dude," I would always tell him, "I'm like, dude, you have to realize that people d dislike you for sure, but our team was already hated heavily before you joined." Like, I, I don't think he realized it like when he played with us, but adding him as well, like with his reputation that year of everything that happened, like all yeah. the, the toilet boys yeah. stuff. Yeah. All the, all the dumb stuff that happened, like adding him on top of the team, our team that everybody, I feel like didn't really like that much. Like we dominated that year. And that was, the, they, that was the year where we just, we won every scrim. That was like the one year that I feel like that I played where I like won every scrim when he joined and we won like every regular season game. It felt like, and we were just owning super hard, but I still feel like we, we were hated on so much by so many people that, um, and not to throw like, not to throw like Panda or me or Alec or whoever under the bus, but you know what I think a big difference between your teams and my teams have been is that, because I think we've both been very fortunate to play yeah. multiple years with multiple different teammates, multiple different, like, teams that were all good. And, like, we played with – we did a whole episode on it, basically. Like, the amount of talented players we've had the, the fortune to, like, play with is, like, crazy, like, over the course of our careers. And what I have noticed is when you are a streamer, like, as – professional like i'll use like alec as an example because he was the biggest streamer i played with like as professional of a player as alec was and as good of a teammate as he was with like like he was so good at like bringing ideas into scrims and bringing energy and like his actual like joy for being there just made everyone else have fun like one of the best teammates i've ever had at just making people have fun playing with them like alec was amazing for that but he's not a superhuman you know like when he streams and people are talking about, oh, you guys are so good and you're stomping everyone, you're the best team by far, and like they put these ideas into your head, like Alec isn't invincible. Like any human, if you're telling them something over and over and over and over, like you're gonna start to believe it or you're gonna start to buy into it or it could affect the way that you think. And I think that because we did have a lot more like public facing players, I'd guess, where like, we had a lot more, like, streamers or a lot more people who would, like, be interactive with that way. Like, Benji is the best example. Like, yeah. do you think Benji cared what anyone said? No. Like, he, didn't, <laughs> he didn't see it. Like, yeah. you, like, when I played with him, when you played with him, like, Benji doesn't care. Like, he's not reading Twitch chats. Like, it never even crosses his mind. Um, but I think, like, towards the later years on the Dragons, I could really feel that sort of... It's not that it's external pressure on you. It's that the external pressure makes you put more pressure on yourself where you feel like you have to win everything. Like, you have to win every regular season game. You have to, like, because you don't want to turn on your stream after you lose. Yeah. And hear people, like, 
like I, I think Barra had said it on like uh, on their podcast on the backliners. Like he had said, like part of the thing that made him end up not wanting to go to Worlds is that he doesn't want to hear people tell him like, oh, I'm so sad, like you got kicked, like I you were one of my favorite players, and like it's not that the fans are being mean because they're being very genuine and they're like that, rooting for you and like yeah it, it's just that like in your head the way you internalize that is you don't want to feel that way over and over and it's over. just the most recent like part like thing that happened so that's exactly. why they're going to bring it up like exactly yeah like like people are just like recency bias is a real thing like for sure if you lose the game that day and you turn your stream on they're not going to talk about like all the other games you won in the past they're going to talk yes. about the game you lost say, like, wow, that day you played like crap you know? <laughs> yeah and also also when you are a good team and i'm sure the warriors felt this way too especially after the roster change if you are a good team and people expect you to win and you do have people like let's use genetics for example mm -hmm. who is like very confident like talking trash and is like very comfortable like being the villain when he loses and he turns on his stream, every single person who hates Gen X, they're gonna type like, Jake was better, shouldn't have kicked Jake. Like, yeah. you know, they're gonna say yeah, it, yeah. Of, course, of course they are. They're gonna love it. Um, so yeah, anyways, I think like, this year was the first year that I really felt like none of that other stuff mattered. And the whole year, like we talked about it so many times, like trying to get everyone on the same page and trying to get everyone to believe like, if we play this way, we can win and like we can be other teams doing this. I didn't feel like we truly like accomplished that until the playoff tournament where we lost to you guys in the semis or whatever. Going into that tournament, I felt like we finally truly believed like this is how we can play, this is how we can win. You guys, like, that was a close set too, yeah, even and, though it was like it was you guys three, won three one. one yeah. yeah, it was a really close set. I feel but like we believed we could win. And we played against you guys, and we, like, even though we lost, we, like, came out of that, and we, like, believed we could have beat you if we played better. And it felt like those scrims, I think part of the reason it felt so miserable is, like, we just wanted that chance again, you know? Like, we just wanted to play real games against anyone again because we felt like once everyone finally bought in, like, that's the best feeling for sure. Like, when people really believe and you can feel that they believe it, and nobody cares what other people think. Like, nobody picked us to win. Like, yeah. it'd be insane to pick us to win. Like, I, if I was a fan, I'm not picking anyone other than the top three because the whole year, you'd have no reason to think anything else. You know? No, 100%, yeah. But, yeah, I, I do feel like we've just been, like, on d different teams, like, very different ways that the teams go about, I guess. Like, because you've been on a team For with sure. a lot of streamers. Like, the year we won, like – one of my like i guess so i've been on i guess zap was a streamer like that season three eager team i love that team so much mm -hmm. um but zap's kind of like zap's like introverted like he's, he doesn't talk to like anybody to it and he doesn't care well. either yeah like he's like the best person like out of all the streamers like people say stuff and i feel like he just doesn't care as much as like anybody else he probably does a little bit for sure but like but I feel like it doesn't affect him not nearly as much as other people. You can would tell affect him. Zap gets annoyed when, like, if he's having a bad day and he's like having crappy rank games. Like some days you just wake up and you just aren't feeling it. You know, yeah. you don't have the energy, and like he'll turn on his stream anyways, and then the games are going bad, and then there's people in chat annoying him. Like he'll break a little bit and he'll like show that he's annoyed, but he doesn't really care. Like he's been, yeah, he's been around too long to really care like that. Yeah, one hundred percent. But yeah, like that that season three team, I was gonna say like felt felt like the same way season five splice. Like we all just kept to ourselves and just I think yeah, it is I don't, it's the yeah. better way to be competitively, I think. It's 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 hard though, because I think you could still do it. Like Zap is a perfect example, I feel like, who 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 does it really, really well. Like he's won worlds three times mm -hmm. while at the same time being a like full time yeah. content creator. <sighs> like I feel like People always meme Zap and say he's overrated or like this and that, but he, for him to do that, that's a pretty big feat in itself that he is able for to sure. do content and win as much as he did. But I feel like also the teams he he was on um, definitely helped. Like I feel like PK as well, like like Paul especially. Like not a lot of people really know Paul that much. I feel like he's not really an outspoken sure. person, and 
Like, who, who could you say is the most outspoken on, like, the PK team that he was on? It was, like, Neil. Neil? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Neil. And, like, even Neil, like, likes to oh, keep to himself. all the time or anything. Yeah. yeah. So I feel like it definitely it definitely helps in that regard, I guess, as well. And then same thing with the, all the Levi's guys when he was on that team. They, they weren't really streaming a lot that year. But, yeah. But, like, you, like, Nika did a pretty good job, too. Like, Nika streamed a lot this year, I feel like. And well, like... The thing is, I, I, yeah. don't, I don't mean it to come across as, like, I'm slamming them, but, like, you know, like we are all people at the end of the day. Like, I think what a lot of people don't know about being a pro player, like, obviously, like, I'll always preface it, like, obviously we're very fortunate to live the lives we've had and, like, play a game that oh, we love man. and, like, yeah. and share it with so many people that care about it and, like, want to hear us talk about it or whatever. Like, uh, unreal, like, unforgettable memories forever, like, that type of experience but when you are the the downside of it is when you are working a like public facing job or you are a content creator or you are a streamer like everyone just has bad days like there could be something going on with like your friends or family or your relationships or like maybe or scrims even scrims even yeah, yeah. You just be in a bad mood in general like you just be having like a tough time and when you have to go stream and then people say stuff that's negative like no matter how used to it you are or how numb to it are there's going to be times where it gets to you so like Nika, for example, like it would leak over actually the start of the second phase. We actually, when we made a roster change, something we talked to Nika about was he was just being affected by like Twitch numbers were down and people were saying like, as a joke, everyone's just like, oh, Smite's dead, dead game, all this type of stuff. And like, he's trying to like stream and enjoy the game and have fun with it. And he feels like other people aren't sharing that with him. And it, like, it affects you. And then if you come to scrims and, like, we're not doing well or we, like, started off the phase one and four and we're just not winning games, like, all that stuff adds up. And it was, like, noticeable in his mood. Like, he brought less energy. He was, like, he was kind of deflating us a little bit in scrims because, like, you could tell, like, he just, he felt like, he just felt down about it in general. And when we had a roster change, we were, like, hey, man, like, we know it's tough and, like, we know you're streaming a lot and all of this stuff and it can get to you, but, like, we really need you to like do your best to like bring and he was great like ever since that like he was great with like energy and trying to have fun and trying to get people like on the same page or like playing to the crowd at worlds even like sometimes i'm a little like like don't you know like i trolled so hard like our first game against you guys we like killed three of you and didn't do gold fury after and it was because like we just got over excited and like the crowd is like it just gets it, yeah it just got to us at that time but like it, yeah ba basically my point is like no matter how used to it or how like much you train yourself to not care, like everyone cares a little bit. Like even though we have been around forever, like it's still going to piss me off if people call me like washed or whatever. Cause like I've had versions where I'm really successful when I feel like I'm not playing well. And I've had versions of teams where I feel like I'm playing pretty well and we're just struggling to win anyways, you know, like it goes both ways. Yeah, I know. I, f I feel that a lot. Like it just feels, I, I going back to like everything like i guess that's just one like you said it's one way i motivated myself i guess is that i i guess i played with like a chip on my shoulder that i everybody always thought that i wasn't very good even though i i'm sure people don't think that but that's how i always felt and that's what motivated me to play better well when i first started playing yeah. against you and i didn't even know you that well i i think we've talked about this before too it was like at first everything you did was cheese like like, oh, that guy's only winning because he's, like, cheesing the game. He's playing Fenrir <laughs> support. Like, it's not a good pick, you know? Yeah. Like, they would never, like, and same thing with Eager. It's like, oh, they're just invading. They're just cheesing games. They're not actually better. Like, there's there was always something, I feel like, with your, you and your team specifically, there's, like, there's always a reason. Yeah, like, there's always an excuse, Oh, right? they're just yeah. excusing the game, or they're just, like, <laughs> yeah. you know, what, like, they're not actually that good of players. Like, you know, they're just, like, doing this or, you know, whatever. Or, oh, they're getting lucky. Whereas I feel like the praise other teams got like when the warriors won this year or the levi's won this year i feel like it'd be like oh they're just so much better than everyone like mm -hmm. mechanic oh my god can you believe what they're able to do with these characters and it was like it just painted in a very different light for sure yeah but i i feel like this year and like the season eight titans year i feel like we did get a lot of praise like that we are doing like really well for sure but mm -hmm. just like it's just funny though, because I always like, I'm like, oh yeah, what's the excuse gonna be this time after we won? That's a, that, that was always my favorite thing. Yeah, but I will say the one thing I'm most proud of of like, even though I was unable to win at the end of like this last worlds, like 
from season five all the way until this world, every single playoff event um, that ever happened, my team either won the event or um, we either won the event, lost in finals, or lost to the team that won the event except one tournament. And the one tournament that we, we, um, we didn't – the team that beat us – didn't win the finals was when the Kings beat us and they lost to you guys when you picked Scream Up. That was the only time that's ever happened like where the team that beat us. Nine, right? yeah. yeah. And then we made roster changes after them. Like, well, I guess that's why we made. <laughs> I was thinking to myself, I'm like, I guess it finally broke the streak. And then I guess that's why we made a roster change. But also, every time we didn't make the finals, I know we, we were a hard team to beat because every time we didn't make the finals, we would at least go to match point. And then in the finals, we got swept a couple times. But we would every time outside of the finals, we never lost except on match point, which is crazy for I feel all like the your sets. Team, the Titans in season eight, you guys reverse swept, I want to say back to back tournaments. No, just like, one. I thought you guys well, did we it reverse twice. swept. I think we did it in the regular season one time. Oh, yeah, or yeah something. maybe that's what it was. But we yeah. did it, we did it against the Kings, I think, in the fall split of season eight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the, in the, playoffs for yeah. that i just remember feeling like your teams were always very mentally strong which i honestly i think this year was definitely the mentally strongest team i've ever had and i think like our run wouldn't have been possible without it for sure because i think just literally making like between game adjustments was so much better on this team because like nobody really cared about who was right or who was wrong and if like we used to have issues where, like, if you wanted to ban a character in someone else's role, they'd, like, your first reaction is to be a little defensive. I know, like, earlier in my career, I was guilty of that, too, where, like... I mean, I feel like everybody is at some sure. point. And, yeah. Well, especially if it's not delivered the best way where you're just like, oh, this guy's just doing so much, and you're like, okay, well, like, we could do this or that, or it's, like, not because of that character. Mm -hmm. uh, but on this team, I feel like nobody actually cared. Like, if we were, like hey, Nika, we want to, like, we know you've been owning on Bologna, but we feel like it's their best pick and they're just going to first pick it. We want to ban it. He'd be like, okay. And, like, that's just the end of it, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think, like, having feelings like that was good. I, I think maybe a, a good topic to wrap it up on, maybe this, honestly, maybe this is too long. Maybe it'd be good to do a whole other episode on it. We should at least mention it. The thing that you feel like you're most proud of throughout your career, like, I'll... I can go really quick. Like, sure. mine would be, even though I'd say, like, there have been times in my career, like, season eight, I was exhausted. Like, the amount of effort I put in season eight was not higher than season seven. But for what I was able to give, I still feel like I gave it, like, everything I could. Like, regardless of what result we would have had this past week, like, week or whatever with Worlds, I would have never looked back on my career and felt like I didn't try my hardest, you know? Like, I always felt like no matter what team I was on, no matter what season I was on, whether I was on a bad team, a good team, a favorite, not a favorite, I felt like there was never a time where I didn't give my teammates like everything I could, kind of. And I feel like I would never look back and regret that, I think, for sure. Yeah, same with me. Like I feel like every season I've always tried my best, and I always feel like – um I'm hard to play with. I feel like I, I feel like anybody that's played with me will tell you that I'm pr probably pretty hard. I expect a lot from like everybody that I play with. Like, I expect people to want to scream. I expect people to show up on time. I expect people to do the things that they're supposed to do playing. And I feel like I've always gotten a lot of all out of all the people I've played with for the most part. I mean, there's some exceptions here and there, but I feel like f f in general, out of all the years I've played, I feel like all the teams I've been on have at least had a decent shot to win. And I feel like. I've given my all to try to do that, so I've been. I'm happy with that. Yeah, I think is there a is there a moment or accomplishment that you were most proud of? That's not like winning worlds. Like for example, the thing you said about like for that many years, like either probably that or losing to it. yeah yeah I, that for you. You think? Yeah, I feel like it just shows. Even though we didn't win every tournament, which sucks, it, it just shows that we at least. We didn't go down without a fight unless it was in finals. So, yeah. Yeah, I don't know what mine would be, like, a small accomplishment. Honestly, maybe it honestly might have been the season four United team. I feel like 
at that point, like, I definitely was young and I bought into the narratives more because I was like literally 21 years old and I was the oldest person by far on that team. <laughs> uh, everyone else was like 18 or younger. Maybe Benji was 19. Yeah. But I remember on that team, like the narrative was so heavy. Like everyone thought the European teams were just so much better. And I remember being really proud that everyone on my team, like even though no one else thought we would win, like we all believed in each other a lot. And that team, I'll still say to this day, was the most – toxic team i've been on in terms of like the way we delivered criticism to each other was very blunt and direct and not sugar-coated at all but it worked for you guys yeah and it worked for us but nobody ever felt like their teammates didn't believe in them like yeah then got the worst of it for sure because he, like, <laughs> he was we just expected a lot of them because we were basically two one two in and like yeah max would win a lot of our lanes and Benji and Scream would win a lot of their 2v2s and we're like, you need to call every rotation. You need to be here if their mid laners are rotating. If you're not doing damage, what the heck are you doing? You're not getting a red buff. It belongs to Max, by the way. Like, <laughs> you're not getting any buffs. You're not getting any farm. We don't care. Like, you have to just do you all. You can't die either. Easily, yeah, don't, yeah, don't die to ganks. You're going to ruin our game. Like, <laughs> don't get, don't feed the jungler so when he comes to my lane, he doesn't kill us. Yes, he was, he was literally like the dirty work and tangibles player. But there was never a moment where we didn't believe believe in him even though i'm sure for a couple months he got he got the work verbally <laughs> like you know like i think that's what i'd be most proud of is like any team where everybody felt like their teammates believed in them that is like the best feeling for sure because everyone always has it like in the back of their head like if you're struggling like you don't want to think like oh does my team want to replace me do they not think i'm good enough like all that yeah so I, I think any team environment where people believe believed in each other and knew that their teammates believed in them that was always the best feeling to me yeah i think this year for like for this team especially was very interesting because i feel like at the beginning of the year everybody was like 50 50 on how they felt about each other but as soon as we won that first tournament everybody bought in and believed in each other a lot more and i feel like that win helped us a lot like in terms of how everybody um how we wanted to play the game and how we wanted to, it made everything a lot easier for us to come together and i feel like going through all the troubles we went through in like that first phase when we didn't do very well um, helped us so much. And I feel like that's a big thing of playing, like it, going through things in, in the season helps so much. Like losing helps you no matter what. And For sure. I feel like being able to be, be who you are regardless win or lose is a hard thing to do. And I feel like if you're able to do it, you always put yourself in a good spot to win, and I feel like that's what you guys, you guys did all year as well. Is there a uh, – I'll just think of, like, a couple quick things, I guess. Is there a favorite season that you played? Like, was there a – like, the literal game itself, not your team. The was game Was there a itself. favorite season that you had? I don't know. It's hard for me to see. Do you have one or no? No, that's why I wanted to ask yeah, you. Yeah, I don't really have one. I enjoy the changes, I think. Like, I enjoy the the process of, like, problem-solving new things, I think, is just fun. Yeah. I've enjoyed stuff about every season. Like, there hasn't been one thing. Like, if I stopped enjoying the game, I wouldn't be playing it at all. Like, that's how – I've been here for so long. There's a reason why I'm here, so I like the game a lot. And no. if I didn't like it and I wasn't having fun, I would be. I would have been done long, long, long time ago. So For sure. I think um, – unless there's anything else you have, I want to wrap this one up a little bit. I think for anyone who was wondering, we do, we do definitely want to talk about – smite 2 and all that other stuff yeah like, we should do that in another episode i guess because we've been yeah. going for a long time now yeah it, it'd be cool to maybe do like a, a smite 2 like wish list or things that you want to see or something like that i think would be cool also for everyone in chat or anyone who's listening to the to the recorded version of this we are not sure so yeah we'll go home in a couple weeks you said probably yeah this is so basically this is like the season one finale of travelers proc like mm -hmm. that like me and mike things are going to be different going forward we're, we're going to figure out we, we haven't we haven't talked about it enough to know exactly what our plans are yet but i think it is going to be this is probably the last one if maybe who knows i, I shouldn't say last but as of now we probably won't do it in the studio again, at least for a while, if ever. So it'll be online. We're still planning on doing it, but we got to figure out what we want to do exactly with, with the 
podcast. Yeah, and and we'll let you guys know we don't want huge downtime the way we've had in the past. Yeah. Like, I feel like it'll be easier. But like, we're, we're not scrimming right now, so it'll be exactly, easier to yeah. figure it out a lot faster because that's what usually got in the way of this whole thing. Even if scrimmed. the dates have to change, like we don't do it the same day every week. I still think. Yeah. We'll try to be better about just making sure we like get it out. I think also. Um, you know, those of you who already follow him on Twitch, like, you've been streaming a lot more at the start of Season 11, I think. Like, I'm sure we're both going to want to play, like, Smite 2 whenever it has, like, beta phases and everything like that. Like, yep. Um, so, yeah, we'll be in touch. We're not going anywhere. We'll tweet it out, let you guys know whatever the future may hold with that. I think it'd be cool to do, like, uh, if we aren't in studio, doing more, like, interactive episodes could be cool, too. Yeah. Like, chat or whatever. So, uh yeah, basically, thanks to everyone who has watched us over, I guess, the past half year, year, whatever. 22 yeah. episodes. I think this is our 22nd episode. That's crazy. I looked. Yeah. I was like, I can't believe we did 20 of these. And you're like, yeah, that sounds about right. But I, I, it's still surprising to me it that is, we did yeah. 20. Yeah. It, it yeah. Honestly, like, it doesn't feel that way because we've are, always had, like, so many guests and stuff. But, but yeah, I, I think, yeah, thanks, to everybody, for listening. We're definitely going to try to keep doing our best to put them out and do stuff i mean as aurora just said a second ago like there's a reason we've still been around for so long because we love the game and we love what we do so yeah being able to share it with people is always nice yeah i think that's all i have for for this one i think this episode should still be on spotify at inside the spl you can find it on my youtube channel and then at, we'll always stream it on aurora's channel no matter what and then as we change stuff in the future We'll keep you guys, you guys posted. Yeah, yeah. You guys will know. Yeah. Is there a date for the next one? Um, we got to talk about that still, I feel like. Yeah, I think I'm still in Georgia for a little while, so it's mostly around when I'll you want to move or what you want to do. With yeah, that. we should we should do one pretty soon, I feel like. we gotta. I want to figure out a couple things before we do it, though. Sure. And then once we figure that out, we'll, we'll definitely get them going again. Yeah, and wh whether you're listening live or uh, recorded, definitely, like – YouTube comments section, Twitter, wherever, like, if you guys have ideas or things you want to hear us talk about, whether it be Smite 2 or Season 11 or anything. Or even a guest. Like, if we're going to go online, sure, yeah. we can get, like, any guests now as long as we communicate with them. So. Yeah, just let us know. I think we're we're pretty open to, to whatever. But, yeah, thanks again, everybody. Thanks. Also, I got to say, uh, especially if it is the last one we do in studio, thank you to the Hires production staff, like, Lewis, Billy, Jordan, Lewis, yeah. Billy, like Graham, like whoever else has been here. I don't know. If Mike is well back, but yeah, when he was Mike, still here, yeah. I don't know if Tristan has been here yeah, and helped out any of the bit. times, but yeah, anyone in production or at the studio, anything like that. Thank you guys for, uh, for hosting us and letting us be able to use it. We've had, we've had a lot of nights. We've gone well past their work hours <laughs> yeah. after a full day of SPL. So it's definitely appreciated. And then uh, shout outs to Graham as well. Hindu man for the one coming up with the idea to do it because he was the one who approached me yeah. about it and then i think he told you as well but yeah, yeah he was the one who kind of got it going so big shout outs to him appreciate it yeah so i'm yeah thanks to everyone for the help glad people have enjoyed it uh this is not the final episode but it is probably season one finale i guess is what yes. we're calling it yeah yeah um so yeah i think that's it for us thanks everybody for watching enjoy the enjoy the rest of your weekend and that's all bye guys One if I'm trolling from Pro Professor BM. You can hear the audience. I wonder if there's.